While running away, the MC thinks about life. It's like an egg, a boiled egg. Meaning that no matter what you do, there is no real meaning. His chasers catch up to him and search his belongings for a relic. They find it, and that's when they decapitate him, ending his life. It seems to not be so, however, as he speaks to the mother of corruption, a hand that is grabbing his body while screaming murder. He tells her not to get angry, as he has already collected the divinity inside the relic. He grabs his head from the snow and reattaches it, saying that he did lose a bit of money in the process of all this. We get his backstory. His life as he reached his late twenties made him too tired and busy to play games. And that's why he always made compromises when playing them, by using an editor. But one game he kept playing, in order to play as the priest of corruption, the hardest to progress, and the worst performing class. He couldn't control himself, as his heart was always racing whenever he played like this. Around the time he completed his class quest, and all his class progression materials were gone, he got transported into the game, and became the priest of corruption. The hand that keeps screaming at him is the goddess he serves, the mother of corruption. He started serving her five years ago, when he just woke up inside the game, with only a robe and her hand that was laying on his chest. But because of her large presence, he felt a connection to the hand, and was able to accept that he got transported into the game pretty early on. According to the description of the game, the Priest of Corruption is a genetically enhanced human modified by drugs, and as a result of this, he had enhanced physical capabilities, heightened senses, and a body that can only be killed by divinity. And there's also that he wasn't able to stand the sight of blood before, but the scene that's unfolding right in front of him, which is quite gruesome, has no effect on him. The only real problem he has is that his body can no longer feel or taste anything. Inside of an adventurer's guild, he gets his ID, the receptionist there calling him Priest Marnak. He asks her about work, and she gets to searching, saying that there must be some work for a priest who is serving the goddess of preservation like him. Marnak thinks about this. After entering the northern city of Guis, where he is now, he decided to impersonate a member of the Order of Preservation. If he was under a different god, the respective god would have become furious and marked him the moment he impersonated a member of another order, a mark only other members can see, the seal of punishment. However, the mother of corruption is benevolent in regards to such things. The order of corruption is the enemy of all, and he, who was also hated by all, was mother's only follower. The receptionist finally pulls out a job for him. Marnak reads about it and finds out it's a bandit or monster hunting. The Lord of Guiz sending this out because farmers have recently gone missing while heading to Guiz, and those who find the reason and defeat it are rewarded with 30 nips of silver per head. The receptionist is surprised that he can read, him thinking that he was able to read and write in the language of this world the moment he got here. He puts the paper down and sheepishly asks the receptionist to give him part of the reward right now. While traveling for the job, he notes that the receptionist talks a lot. She gave him the money, but he will have to pay a fine if he is late. He speaks with the mother, who asks if he has fallen in love already. He gets angry, saying that he did not in fact do that. From behind him, someone speaks his name. It's Pierre, a local from the area. He asks Marnak if he wants to talk. He doesn't say anything, but Pierre still talks his ear off with a myriad of things, on how his parents are doing and rumors about the kidnappings. He suddenly gets called in the front of the group and leaves Marnak. The mother tells him to kill everyone, but he refuses, as he really needs the money to spend this winter in warmth. He also asks her how many fingers she would raid everyone, and a hand symbol appears near everyone with different numbers of fingers raised. The fingers mean the amount of divinity they're worth, with one being ten, two one hundred, and so on. And if he manages to collect a hundred thousand divinity, Marnak gains one authority, and thanks to the system, he was able to absorb the divinity of a holy relic and gained an authority. The mother said that if he were able to collect the divinity of every relic, all his wishes would be fulfilled. He thinks that he will wish for his sense of taste back first. Pierre comes back, who apparently got chewed out for talking too much. Marnak says that he doesn't mind, but in that moment the party gets attacked. He protects Pierre by throwing him out of the line of fire, taking the bolts for him instead. The mother asks him to just play dead and kill them when they get close. That would be the easiest. But Marnak rises and grabs a sword, saying that he does things his own way. He rushes the attackers and swiftly takes the head of one. The captain orders his men to take care of the rest, 
as he will deal with the priest until then. He rushes Marnak, who pushes him out of the way. He asks Mother for her rating, but doesn't get a moment's rest, as the captain forces him to exchange blows. The Mother says that he is worth two and a half fingers, with Marnak noting that it's the same as the ranger who killed him previously. He is ecstatic that the game is so unbalanced. The captain summons all his might in one strike and breaks Marnak's sword. He laughs at him, noting that is the reason he always uses frost steel. He tells Marnak that he will let him go, as this was the last job in the area. So why don't they call it quits and leave with smiles on their faces? Marnak refuses, instead proposing something else. If they leave right now, he will go easy on them. The captain wonders if they would have just walked away like that. Marnak tries to say something but gets an arrow in the head, much to the captain's delight. His group says that he saw him split Marnak's sword in two, him bragging that he perfectly calculated where to swing. He asks them if they took care of the rest, and they confirm that they did. Suddenly, Marnak rises from the ground and speaks, much to their shock. He asks why they are so surprised. Have they never seen someone survive being shot in the head with an arrow? They clearly have not. He begins praying to Mother, a green aura starting to emanate from him. The captain orders his men to shoot, but the bolts don't do anything to him. Seeing this, they try to run away, but are stopped by an invisible wall. This wall is called, the line in which the living cannot pass, and it's an authority that the priest of corruption must activate before using his powers. It prevents targets from getting away while also concealing the divinity of corruption. He adds that he really likes this authority. Mother watches this from above, smirking. The captain says that they should try and slice through the barrier but gets crushed by a gigantic monster. The captain's men try to leave, begging the priest for forgiveness. Marnak tells the monster that apart from their heads, he can have everything else. He goes back to his party and sees that it has been decimated. The mother asks him to collect the divinity from the bodies, but he refuses, as that would cause a lot of suspicion from the guild and they would surely investigate. He spots Pierre, who is barely clinging on to dear life. Marnak thinks that by saving him, his reputation will increase, and thus he asks Mother to stop the progression of his wounds. In an undisclosed location, a priest holds the cup Marnak sucked the divinity out of, asking a man what happened to the boy who stole this artifact. The man says that he was beheaded on the spot, but left the body there, because they had no supplies to spare. The priest proclaims that she will go on a pilgrimage, much to the man's surprise. He asks if it's because of the prophecy, and she says that it is, and because she has someone to meet. While Marnak is carrying Pierre back to safety, we get the explanation on what the prophecy is. Ten years ago, all religions received it. The end will wear the husk of life, and come to fall upon the world. The receptionist goes up to Marnak saying that it's okay to get inside the town, as she already got permission from the guards. While walking, she says that he didn't seem that strong at first, and also asks him for the heads he is carrying, saying that the guild will take care of that. She also asks him if he has anywhere to sleep, and if he hasn't, he should sleep at her place. This makes him blush, much to the dismay of the mother, who is screaming bloody murder. He says that he had no devious intentions with the lady with red hair, all she meant was that she would let him sleep in the guild guest room, surely. Someone knocks at the door, it's the receptionist, who says that there's something he needs to attend to. While they speak, Mother is giving her the middle finger under the sheets. She tells Marnak that the Lord wants to see him, who wonders why the Lord would request for him. The receptionist says that it's most likely because the captain of the mercenary group he was with is actually the Lord's half-brother. Marnak arrives at the Lord's residence, where the Lord of Guise, Traden Filian, asks him if he was the one who saw his brother's final moments, and if he would like some tea. Marnak smirks, with Mother drawing a giant X when she saw the Lord. Marnak asks him how life as a human is, calling him a demon. He thinks that there's only one reason Mother drew that X, because the Lord wasn't a living being, and amongst the others, only one is able to take the form of a human, demons. While they are stronger than any being, they can't do anything on their own. In order to do that, they have no choice but to make deals with beings of this world. That's why demons love all living beings. However, the gods hated them because they have as much as they took, with them finally declaring to their followers and all living beings that these beings will be called demons, and they are evil. This being what started the priest's hunt for demons. 
Marnak thinks about this. The demon contractor was a difficult class, and people avoided it like the plague. He remembers this because it was the second class that he played. The Lord sits in silence, but finally speaks. He says that because of his brother's death, he was able to welcome an important guest. He tells Marnak that he must be lying about his identity, seeing as he saw through him and all. He can call him Crawling Bait. Marnak also reveals his identity. He is a priest serving the mother of corruption. The Lord is surprised that there's still a living son of corruption. He urges Marnak to take a seat, being as they are the only ones here. The Lord says that he called him here to tell him how his brother died. He will be sure to pay him for his efforts. Marnak agrees. Having finished the conversation, Marnak thinks that it was quite the unfortunate event, as the brother was struggling with work, and the Lord gave him some work under the table, causing his death as a result. We see the Lord's reaction after hearing this, looking quite sad. Marnak speaks to Mother, saying that he wasn't tempted with the gold, it being a representation of the Lord's pure intention to know the truth. The Mother calls him a greedy priest, but he exclaims that he is not. He also says that another fact about gold is that it doesn't rot, with the mother taking this as an insult. Marnak says not to be hasty and to let him finish speaking. There is something that doesn't rot and lasts as long as gold, that is the love he has for her. The mother is left speechless and gently holds her hand against his chest. He adds that for him, she will always be the most important thing, so there's no need to worry. He goes back to the guild where the receptionist tells him to greet the priests from the teaching sect. Marnak notes that he doesn't want to deal with those freaks right now. His eyes suddenly widen, as one of them is holding a holy relic. One of them comes right up to him, commending his dedication for being a priest of preservation. He introduces himself. He is the weight of the scale of retribution, Orivs. The people next to him are called Kornu, a man with a horn in his head, and Patina, a woman. Marnak does the same and the receptionist notes that they will be staying here just like him. Marnak thinks that this is perfect, as he will have many opportunities to steal the relic from now on. They excuse themselves, saying that they have to go visit the Lord of Guise. The receptionist notes that for priests like them, they ask for a small price. Marnak wondering if he will have to pay as well. She says that she didn't let him stay because of an interest in him. However, she did have some intention of her own to help him. She gets close and whispers that she would like him to cast a blessing of preservation on the food they have, so that it won't go bad. He retreats, asking why she got so close just to whisper that. She wonders why. Someone says that it's getting along well. It's Kornu, who stayed behind as to not cause any trouble due to his race, as many northern lords don't have good impressions of him. The receptionist notes that the lord isn't like that. Even if he seems cold, he is good at his job, and there are a lot of people who support him in Guise, so they should refrain from speaking poorly of him. He asks to know more about the Lord, and they all begin talking about him for a while. Marnak asks him why they suddenly decided to visit the Lord, and Kornu says that it's because of the prophecy. Orvis thinks that the, the husk mentioned in it is supposed to be a demon, and he is here to check for this. Inside the Lord's mansion, the relic they are holding suddenly lights up, it being able to detect demonic beings. They get into position, but that's when the mansion explodes and the Lord reveals his true form, crawling weight. Marnak and Kornu spot the commotion, with Priest Orvis casting scales of retribution and hitting the beast right on its head, causing another explosion. Kornu says that this is possible because of Orvi's hammer of punishment. They need to go get help. Marnak bolts in another direction, saying that he should go first and that he will be right behind them. He rushes to the Adventurer's Guild, and asks the receptionist about the location of the medical center where Pierre is being treated. He picks her up and dashes with might out of the Adventurer's Guild, landing and sprinting to the medical center. The receptionist spots the monster as it has made its way to the center of the city. Marnak says to forget about it for now. She must tell him the location of Pierre. She does so, and they find him safe and sound, resting. Marnak notes that he can't let Pierre die after he barely managed to save his life. He picks him up and asks the receptionist to grab onto him, as he can't carry her with both arms anymore. She does so, and they begin running again. She adds that there is a secret passage, poking at it and saying that it will lead to the outskirts of Geese, but the door is locked shut. This proves to be no challenge for him, however, as he smashes the door with his foot, the receptionist noting his strength. 
Marnak puts her down, saying that if things get worse, she should take Pierre and run. He has to go help. He arrives at the location of the battle and spots Cornu, who has been mortally wounded. Marnak asks where the other priests are, and he says that Patina is dead, with her right arm and leg completely gone. He also asks Cornu if there is any way to defeat the monster. He speaks with his last moments left. The only way to defeat the monster is with the white sword, the relic they brought. Orvis managed to stab it into the beast's head. If he manages to take that sword and stab it in the brain, it should die. With these words spoken, he passes away. Marnak collects from him, gaining 100 divinities. Orvis continues his battle against the demon and manages to hit the sword with his hammer, causing it to go deeper. Marnak notices it and jumps on it as well, spotting the white sword Orvis is using. But the monster suddenly rolls with all its might, throwing Marnak off. His mother is worried about him, but he says that he is fine. It seems that fortune smiled on him, however, as he got thrown right next to the holy relic they were using. He grabs it and asks his mother to give him another authority. She does so, and Marnak gains 10,000 authority points. Marnak asks what seal has been lifted this time, and it seems that mother can go further from his location. He jokes that the effect is pretty minuscule. He prays once again to mother, offering her 10,000 divinities in exchange for a new authority. It seems that this time he gained the text of corruption, the effects of which are simple yet powerful. The moment it is activated, metaphysical green tattoos appear all over his body and amplify his physical abilities. He notes that it will be pretty useful in this situation, with his broken leg also being healed. He spots Orvis next to him, thinking that he must have been thrown off too at that time, but he didn't survive. Marnak collects him, gaining a thousand divinities. The demon is still rampaging, with Marnak noting that this is odd, as the people who brought out its anger, the priests, are all dead, and it shouldn't do it anymore. He thought that demons weren't beings that followed instincts, but that's when he spots something and activates the text of corruption, saying to his mother that things might shake a bit. He rushes to the demon's location and jumps a large distance. It tries to hit him, but he is swift and dodges. He gets on top of the demon and spots the sword, but suddenly the beast tries to do the same move to throw him off again, but the same trick won't work twice, as Marnak jumps down and gets away, the attack missing him completely. But a bit of blood still comes out of his mouth, saying that it's progressing faster than expected. While climbing the beast again, he notes that when the text of corruption is used, his body starts to rot from inside, so he must end this quickly. He jumps and grabs the sword, thinking of the words Cornu said to push the sword in. He does the opposite, however, and pulls it out, causing a ray of blue light to come out of the wound, eliminating the demon in an explosion of light. Lord Traden is left in the location of the beast, and Marnak asks if he is awake now. The Lord says that it was a real blessing meeting him. Marnak says that there's no need for that, as the sword was suppressing his mind. He reaches his hand out, and the Lord says that the two golds worth of help was definitely worth it. Where Marnak was decapitated, the blue-haired priestess looked for his body with the help of the ranger who did it. The body is not there, however, with the ranger noting that it was probably dragged away by monsters or wild beasts. The priestess says that it's possible and thanks him for the help, but also asks him the name of each nearby city. In disguise, Marnak is being led by a butler who guides him through the ruble to a nearby house, where Traden welcomes him with open arms, saying that he is growing more handsome every time he sees him. Marnak thanks him, and Traden says that he is their demon slaughterer. There's no way to express his gratitude. Marnak jokes that the demon is alive and well in front of him, with Traden jokingly saying that he needs to live too. He's not wrong. Marnak thinks about what happened. After everything was taken care of, Lord Traden shared with the town that he was the one who defeated the great demon who appeared, and that he also saved the Lord. As a result, he was given the nickname Demon Slaughterer, even though it really doesn't fit him. And Aaron, the receptionist, has a special fondness for that nickname, so she refuses to stop calling him that in public, grabbing the attention of everyone around. With people coming close to him and praising him constantly, he clearly doesn't like it. Marnak speaks to Traden, saying that it's odd to see his prosthetic arm and leg move so smoothly. He says that he only moves like this in front of him. He limps when he's around other people. But in order to move naturally like this, he needs to pay a large price. Marnak wonders what it might be with anticipation, and Traden says that the hairs on his head will lose their strength and start falling. In a few months, 
he will be faced with a bald head. Marnak imagines it and cries. He also asks if he has a week's worth of time, which he does. Traden says that he received a job that asks specifically for Marnak. It has to do with the holy relics of the ancient empire. The reward is five whole nips of gold, paid in advance too, and if they deemed that he was a large enough help, they would give him one of the undiscovered relics. This seems like a gold mine for Marnak, so he takes the job. He thinks about the ancient empire. They ended the era of distraught mages and brought unity to the continent. And in their current age, where their technology has been recreated, those holy relics are known as precious treasures that contain powerful abilities. In other words, most of the items that are considered high-ranking items are actually relics of the ancient empire. Marnak greets the group that he will be going with. The one who requested this job, Carmen Valtus, offers him a handshake, with Marnak noting his name. Carmen says that what he's thinking is correct. Anthony Valtus of the Black Wolves is his father. He is his illegitimate child. Marnak thought that such a principled man as Anthony wouldn't have had other relationships after losing his wife, but it wouldn't be proper to open the topic. Marnak asks him to introduce the people behind him, and Carmen does so. The mage with the robe is Tunisa. She's the guide. And Sukus, who's part of the Unihorn tribe, is a big guy. Sukus shakes hands with Marnak, calling him the demon slaughterer. Marnak says that he is embarrassed when people call him that. But Sukus rebuts this by saying there's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's a mighty compliment that he has achieved. Carmen speaks up, saying that now that they have introduced each other, they should get going, as it will take them two days to reach the site. Two days later, they make camp and relax for the night. Carmen and Marnak are not sleeping. Marnak says that he's had enough sleep and doesn't feel tired. With plenty of time until the sun rises, Carmen asks him if he has any interesting stories. He is sure someone like Marnak has met his fair share of women during his life. Marnak says that he doesn't. He is just like fresh snow. Carmen instead asks what kind of women he likes, and he says that he likes women who prefer to be by his side. Carmen approves, saying there's nothing better to see than your lady sleeping peacefully by your side. But personally, he believes that a woman's heart is the most important, with the mother agreeing. He believes that the heart is within your chest, and in order for your heart to be welcoming, your chest must be large enough to support it. Carmen is a man who likes women with big chests. Marnak says that it's not bad to have a clear vision of what he wants, but he should talk about this in front of women. Carmen says that of course he wouldn't. He's only saying this because it's with him. He also adds that whenever he speaks with Marnak, it feels like he's talking with an old friend. Marnak says so too, and they spend the whole night talking, much to the dismay of the mother. The next day, they arrive at the ruins, with Tunisa holding a key and saying that she will open the way. Marnak thinks that entering the ruins was quite easy, as they had to just find the key and move to the coordinates written on it. After that, they read the passage written in the ancient language on the key. With that, the key is inserted and turned. However, only mages can read ancient text, so their role in an exploration like this is indispensable. He is an exception, however, as he is a player, and they have this ability too, but he keeps it secret, because in this world where he has no relation, the key is too difficult to get. They enter the ruins and Carmen notes how beautifully preserved this place is, better than most ruins. Marnak looks up, thinking that he finally gets the chance to be inside the ruins he's only seen in photos before. He is truly mesmerized. The mage sees his reaction and scoffs. They go inside the main building, where a towering door stands with ancient text written on it. The mage notes that they need imperial blood to pass. If not, they should prepare for battle. The door slowly opens, and an army of creatures rush them. Sukus is the first to strike, with Tunisa not far behind, as she blows out a large number of them with a single spell. Marnak pulls out his blade and begins cutting them down. The mother suddenly tells him to watch out behind, and he swiftly blocks the last creature's blade. An arrow suddenly pierces its head, however, killing it instantly. Marnak thanks Carmen for the assist. Suddenly he hears a commotion, with Sukus berating Tunisa for using her spells so recklessly. She notes that it was the fastest way, and the creatures all died in the end. So what's the issue? Sukus tries to tell her something, but Carmen stops them, causing him to go sit in a corner, still angry. Carmen commends Marnak for his skills, saying that the title of Demon Slayer suits him. 
Marnak apologizes for displaying such brutish actions as a priest. He also compliments Carmen's bow skills, who says that he has been practicing with it since he was little. Suddenly, Tunisa says that they should move, as she has plenty of mana left. Sukus hears this and gets furious, saying that they barely got any rest. She might not need any since she uses spells, but for melee fighters like him, rest is imperative. Tunisa adds that everyone else would agree with her, and at this point, it just seems like he is trying to make a scene. Carmen orders them to rest before they begin moving, and that's the end of it. Marnak thinks that the mages of this world are usually pompous and mostly extremely rude. It's easy to become a mage, as you are born with it. Although there are differences from person to person, those who are born with mana always awaken once they reach a certain age. When they do, knowledge regarding the ancient language beams into their brains, so they learn ancient spells using the mana that is able to break the laws of this world. Thus, they are reborn whole as a mage. They dislike learning new things, however, as their heads are already filled with knowledge. As a result of this, most mages become iron-willed and uneducated, so they act like idiots. But Marnak notes that even among the mages, she's considered more well-mannered than most. After they finish resting, Carmen says that they should go to the next area. That's when the passage suddenly closes, and a gigantic metal golem is summoned. Marnak adds that the enemies beforehand were too weak for a ruin like this. It seems like this is the real enemy. Tunisa urges them to step aside and begins casting a spell that shakes the ground. The golem looks at her, and his blue gem suddenly glistens. Carmen spots this and urges her to hurry and move out of its way. That's when the golem fires a beam into the roof of the room. This distracts Tunisa, giving it enough time to close the gap. And with one punch, he smashes her into a pulp, leaving nothing left. Sukus watches in horror, and Marnak screams for him to get out of the way. But it's too late, as the golem smacks him into the wall, killing him instantly. Marnak asks Carmen if he wants to live, and if he does, he better tuck his chin in. He suddenly knocks Carmen out and summons a corrupt beast to handle the golem. The giants begin fighting, and Marnak absorbs the divinity of Sukus and Tanisa. He leaves Carmen into a corner and notes that it will take a long time for the corruption beast to finish the battle on its own. So, he activates his text of corruption and rushes in. He adds that his real target is the blue gem that is stuck in the golem's head, as if he breaks that, something will surely happen. He jumps on the corruption beast, giving him ample room to hit the crystal, and so he breaks it. The golem dematerializes, and Marnak thinks that this is probably over. He also congratulates the beast. His victory is short-lived, however, as multiple golems spawn out of thin air. A while later, Carmen wakes up, and he asks if their partners are dead. Marnak says that it is unfortunately so. Carmen notes that they were new hires, and they both died because of his greed. Marnak adds that they were hired for just that. They already knew what could happen in an exploration like this, so he shouldn't blame himself. He also notes that they are beyond the back door, surprising Carmen. He wants to ask how, but notes that he knocked him out before to keep it secret so he won't pry. He also says that now he has a debt towards Marnak, a debt that he will hopefully repay in the future. Marnak graciously accepts this, and notes that they better get moving, as he hasn't defeated all of the metal golems. It seems that there is a sliver of truth in his words, as he left the corruption beast to take the aggro, and threw Carmen into the room, barely managing to escape himself. They reach a door, the end of the ruins. Inside of the room, there are two treasure, a sword and some type of necklace. Carmen says that he has a favor to ask. Can he have the necklace? As he will reward him handsomely for it. Marnak asks what its ability is, and Carmen says that the necklace is called the Bloodline Pathfinder. If you spill some blood on it and think of a bloodline, the necklace will use the blood to point in the direction of the respective bloodline. Marnak thinks about this and smiles, and Carmen confirms his suspicions. He is looking for his mother, whom he has never met before. Marnak asks to take the sword in return. They go outside, where they both note that they barely got out of the ruins. Carmen takes off the necklace and asks Marnak to bless it, since he is a priest. He does so, obviously faking it. Carmen cuts himself a bit and puts the blood on the necklace. Suddenly, a ray of red light emanates from it, and the blood takes shape, pointing somewhere. Carmen is glad that his mother is still alive, and Marnak congratulates him for it. Carmen thanks him profusely, 
saying that he will surely repay this debt. He also says that he has one last favor to ask. He would like it if they work together from now on, just until he meets his mother. And since he's heading west anyways, they can visit the capital so that he may reward him for the job. Marnak smiles, thinking that he would like to accept, but he would definitely see through his intentions right away. He thinks and thinks, causing Carmen to grow worried at the lack of an answer. Marnak smirks and takes his hand, saying that he will gladly support him on the journey to find his mother. The next day, Aaron is a bit furious that he is leaving. She also gives him a silver mercenary plate, noting that it came out faster than expected. Marnak thanks her, but she doesn't want to hear that. Instead, he should say, See you soon, as that would be like a promise. Marnak apologizes to her in his head, saying that he lives the life of a wanderer, so he would never be able to fulfill this promise. She sighs, noting that if he continues to live like this, he won't get a girlfriend and will die alone. So she says, See you soon instead, also saying that the opportunity to meet again will come a lot faster than he expects. Marnak asks what she means, but she shuts him up, saying that this is punishment for leaving. Marnak goes to talk with the Lord, who is as bald as an egg now, but he sees it as more of a truer form of humanity. The Lord also says that since he is heading for the capital, he will give him a recommendation letter. He notes that he would have liked to pay him, but he is dead broke since he had to pay for all of the repairs here in Geese. But the letter will prove useful, as if he gives it to a friend of his that person will help. He also notes that he should ask for help if it's absolutely necessary, as that person is pretty hard to deal with. Marnak thanks him for the gift, and the Lord says that he should think of it as a form of gratitude. He also wishes him a good life, and it is too short to not enjoy. After a few days, Carmen and Marnak are still on the trail, and they note that they will reach the next town in about half a day. Marnak thinks about him. Mother only allowed him to travel with Carmen because he is a three-and-a-half rated human. If he manages to harvest him, he would give 10,000 divinity, meaning he will be able to obtain another authority. The fingers also have the potential to reach four, but personally, he just likes his personality and would prefer him alive. Suddenly, he pulls out his sword and says that there's blood, very close, and it's rapidly approaching. Suddenly, a giant snow spider comes out of the ground, ready to feast. Carmen tries to retaliate with some arrows, but just as the spider is about to attack, Marnak jumps in, cutting some of its legs. He notes that he will have to look for a place to clean this sword the next time he uses it. He strikes the spider once again, noting that it splatters too much blood and flesh. In Guise, the priestess visits the Lord, who apologizes for the current state of the mansion. She gives him a drawing, asking if he has seen this man. The drawing is crudely made to resemble Marnak, and the Lord asks why she wants to see him. She notes that it's for personal reasons. He says that he hasn't, and notes that she should leave, as he quite busy as it is. He thinks that she must not be looking for him with any good intentions. Carmen and Marnak begin dissecting the spiders they have defeated under Carmen's command, as he wants the venom sacs from all of them. He notes that they are pretty good in different situations. They can also be used as poison, and fetch a high price in the market. Marnak asks how he knows all this, and Carmen says that he participated in a lot of monster hunts, so he had plenty of practice. Marnak says that he will take care of them then, as he is covered in blood already. Carmen notes that they still have some road between them and Kelton, so he will teach him, and they can do it together. Later that day, they both arrive at the gates of the town, much to the surprise of a guard, who asks how they got here. They wonder what he means, and the guard says that the town has been blocked off for the last three days, because of the monsters. They ask for the details, and the guard says that monster attacks have become more common, with no corpses to be found. Carmen finds this odd, as what they were attacked by are snow spiders, and it would be extremely difficult for those creatures to leave absolutely nothing behind. Another guard comes by and says that the Lord wants to see them. They do so, and the Lord welcomes them with open arms, knowing Marnak's reputation as a demon slayer. They begin talking about the monster situation, and the Lord notes that this is being organized by a worshipper of an evil spirit. Marnak notes that a single one wouldn't be able to close the gates of an entire city, and the Lord notes that other priests have deduced that there are at least four sects that are working on this. He also says that Kelton is a pretty ordinary town, with nothing notable going on, so why are they a target? They have plenty of supplies, and the troops' morale is pretty good, 
But the problem is that other cities don't know the situation. That's why they need someone to go and spread the news to other cities, mostly a suicide mission at this point. Marnak says that he will help as much as possible. Later he goes to his room, where he gets berated by mother for accepting the job. Marnak notes that they also received an item that he can clean the sword with, and it's quite rare to be found here, as it's from the desert regions. He thinks that the real reason he accepted is because he thought this might be a warning that the main quest would be starting soon. The reason he came to that conclusion is because four different sects are working together. He notes that the title of evil spirit, the beings that these sects worship, seems intimidating, but it doesn't really hold any meaning. It's just a title the main gods throw on other gods, resulting in a stigma being formed. However, one thing's for sure, among the worshippers of the evil spirits, almost none are mentally sane. So unlike the sects under the main gods, sects that serve evil spirits rarely work with each other, so four of them working together is out of the ordinary for sure. Later they ride out to another town, but get attacked by spiders and a myriad of other creatures. Marnak smirks and tells Carmen that he will grab their attention. He is puzzled at his choice, saying that it's too dangerous, even for him. Marnak notes that they will be caught if this keeps up. He throws himself off the horse, noting that he will wait for reinforcement. Carmen screams for him, but he just smiles, asking if he looked cool while saying that. He crashes into the snow, and Mother notes his interesting acting. He smiles, saying that he will take that as a compliment. He also says that they should begin looking for those worshippers as they can't hide forever. Marnak charges in and slashes the beasts left and right, leaving behind their corpses in a pool of blood. He notes that if getting dirty is so frequent, he just might have to carry a bathtub with him. Mother agrees. Marnak walks towards a cave opening and notes that they probably already know he's coming, but aren't greeting him, quite rude. Inside, he finds the things that were missing from the attacked carriages, noting that the monsters must have carried them here. He also finds a body that has been sucked dry by a snow spider. Marnak notes that he understands when one enjoys a nice meal, but to use the leftovers as decor is quite a strange design choice. Mother urges him not to let his guard down, but he assures her that he won't, but also wonders just how many people they manage to eat. There are too many bodies for them to eat within three days, so are they perhaps raising offspring? He continues walking until he finds a giant cave, noting that the tunnels were also pretty big. Marnak smiles noting that there's also a lot of divinity here. The gigantic spider comes out and looms over him while its children descend from the walls. The gigantic spider jumps into action and Marnak asks Mother to draw a line of corruption for him. She does so, and also summons the Beast of Corruption, noting that this human-eating monster will be sacrificed for her. The beast jumps into action and lands a good blow on the spider. Marnak also activates the text of corruption, but the spider is not finished yet as it counterattacks and pushes the beast into the wall. They continue to fight, and Marnak notes that it's almost double the size of the beast, so he needs to help out somehow. He slashes through the other spiders, and thinks that he can sense the energy coming from within the Spider Queen's body, so he has to make sure he doesn't damage it. Suddenly, a spider attacks from behind, and he slashes it in half. This gives him an idea. To not waste the divinity in the Queen's body, he just has to cut all of its legs off. He orders the Corruption Beast to run straight ahead, as he will help it, but it must make sure to stop the Queen from moving. The Beast does so and grabs what he can, and Marnak runs on the wall and swings down, noting that the Queen is just a spider, so all he needs to do is severe the thinnest part of its body. He hits that part again and again, and the Queen screeches in pain. He gets to the last part, and with one powerful blow slashes the Queen in half. The Beast then grabs the upper half of its body and slams it into the ground, and Marnak lands. The beast also looks angrily at him, so he apologizes for leaving it behind previously, and this seems to appease the beast this time. A woman comes out of the queen's mouth, cursing like a sailor while she does so. Marnak smiles gently, and notes that he knew there was a person inside. The woman demands to know who he is in order to ruin her plans like this. Isn't he another follower of an evil spirit, like her? Does he even know how long it took for her to gain control of this thing? Marnak asks her what the purpose of surrounding Kelton is, but she doesn't want to answer, so he just impales her with his sword. His face is not so nice now, and he demands to know why she is surrounding Kelton. She screams that it hurts, but he doesn't care, and asks again. 
She depravedly smiles and says that she won't tell him even if she dies. Marnak smiles and respects her wishes, cutting her head clean off. He gains a thousand divinity and wonders how many worshippers will tell them the truth behind everything. The mother thinks that there are at least more than three, so he chooses to believe that there are four. Marnak walks back to Kelton but finds it up in flames. Inside, the Lord seems to have died a horrible death, while a woman there notes that they wasted precious time getting to this pig. A man asks if they could use incarnation, but a woman with an eye patch notes that it's unstable, and it's not easy to extract divinity from living beings. On top of that, they also manage to lose a few rats because of somebody here. The woman gets mad and notes that she did her utmost. But the monks in the teaching sect kept bothering her. If only Layla sent them a couple of spiders. She also notes that they should have caught the guy who made it out. The eye patch woman also notes that Layla isn't even here yet, and this is not the first time she has done so. But even if she were to assist them with a few spiders, she would have just played around with the bodies. The man urges them to stop fighting, as nothing good will come of it. And since that man managed to escape, troops will be deployed to hunt them down shortly. They also spent many years on this plan, so it must work. The woman notes that she also invested years into this, but she just can't take criticism from him. Do they think she just let him go because she wanted to? Why are they screaming at her for losing one measly rat? And what's with this one? Has he forgotten to mess around with her last night or something? The eye patch woman, having had enough of this, leaves, and the man demands that the woman who was screaming all this time, Parna, stop. He will make sure that Layla takes responsibility for losing the rats. She smiles and notes that it's plenty for her, but that's when the eye patch woman's head flies clean off as Marnak slashes it. He moves on to the man and cuts him in half. He notes that it's pretty unfair for their bet to kill two without asking questions, but these people are able to manipulate authority, so it's better safe than sorry, right? Parna wonders why this maniac is talking to himself, and he looks at her while he slowly regenerates from the text of corruption. Marnak smiles and asks her an all too similar question. What's the purpose of surrounding Kelton? They go outside where Parna presents him with a mass of growing flesh. He notes that she explained everything as soon as he asked, and the story is quite simple. They used all the people in the city as a sacrifice to create this ball of divinity called Incarnation. In order to do all of this, they hid within the city for the last three years, and even though it needed at least five more days of preparation, they had no choice but to rush the plans due to Carmen's successful escape. Marnak revs up his chainsword, much to Parna's dismay, who asks him what he plans to do. He says that he wants to kill that monster, which consumed the flesh and blood of others before it wakes. Parna urges him not to do it, but he does so anyway. She screams that if it's in danger, that being will wake up in an unstable state. The thing slowly rises from the mass of flesh, screaming that it hurts, until it makes its way out and immediately strikes Marnak. The mother notes that there is a holy relic inside that thing, but he knows, and while removing the thing's tentacle from himself, he says that they will make a new authority and sacrifice that slab of meat to her. Parna says that what he will do won't work, but she doesn't get to finish talking, as Marnak cuts her head off, gaining a thousand divinity. With that, he now has a total of 8,592 divinity, with the divinity he extracted from the Lord included. All he needs to get a new authority is 10,000 divinity. He notes that even if he tries to cut this thing down, it will just regenerate itself. But if he continues to get injured like this, he will eventually lose. It seems that there is no other choice. He grabs his sword tightly and dips, confusing both the thing and mother. The thing seeing this screams the only words it knows, it hurts. Marnak makes his way through the town and gains one divinity from each corpse he runs over. The thing chases after him somehow, and he notes that this is like a game. Either the thing will catch him, or he will manage to get a new authority. The thing begins screaming, and it stops Marnak from running away. He notes that even its voice is divine, truly a walking disaster. It tries to attack, but he manages to dodge and asks Mother for assistance. The corruption beast gets summoned over the thing and punts it into the ground, causing all the houses nearby to shake. Marnak looks at the fight and notes that one corruption beast will not be enough, but it just needs to hold on for a little longer, as he will be back soon. He runs towards a burning building, thinking that he needs the bodies of well-trained soldiers or knights at least. He goes inside, but too much time has passed, so Mother cannot extract the divinity from the bodies, 
he notes that up until now, he has accumulated 9,237 divinity, and he just needs a bit more. Suddenly, a wall bursts open, and out of the hole comes a myriad of tentacles that Marnak barely managed to deflect. The thing tries to pounce on him, now having learned a new word. Pain. It seems that it has grown quite a lot from fighting with the corruption beast. Silence falls for a few seconds, and only the wind can be heard. The thing puts its hand forward, and out of it come a lot of tentacles. But Marnak manages to cut them, and this gives him the opportunity to attack. But the thing is too fast and catches him while he's mid-air. With that, it uses the momentum to throw Marnak outside with great force. The mother asks if he's okay, and he confirms this, but also notes how lucky he is. Because the thing just dropped him in the place where the main battle took place. The thing screams, and Marnak urges the mother to take all of the corpses. She does so, and the divinity grows and grows, until it reaches the number of 10,001. He speaks. As her son, he will offer her 10,000 divinity, so she should grant him a new authority. She does so, and everything around is swallowed by a sea of black, including Marnak. He speaks with the thing, and says that it will be in much more pain from now on. The thing goes on the attack, and Marnak explains that this new authority is called the Hole of Corruption. It decomposes all living beings that step inside, including himself. But he is able to use Text of Corruption to choose which parts decompose first. The thing's arm falls off, and Marnak says that he really wants to see which is faster. His regeneration of this hole's decomposition. With that, they engage in a final battle, with Marnak coming out on top. He cuts off the head of the thing, and offers the holy relic to Mother. And so, she lifts the seal. Marnak finds himself outside, but Mother is nowhere to be found, until he looks behind, and notices that she has grown a body. She slowly comes up to him and asks why she's in a child's body. Marnak gently caresses her head, but notes that she should be the one to know that, not him. He also asks if she can't get the divinity out of that thing's body, as it would be a shame if it just went to waste. The mother tries her best, but it seems that she can't. Marnak smiles and says that it's fine if it doesn't work, so she should just come back. She hugs him tightly, and he notes that due to all the divinities mixed up in that thing, it's impossible for her now. But now that they have lifted her seal with the holy relic, he uses the 10,000 divinity from it to get another authority. The sky lights up in a greenish hue, and a green beam descends upon the both of them. Marnak asks what the meaning of this authority is, but the mother smiles and says that he should use it as much as he needs. This time, he received the curse of corruption, an authority that can only be described as evil. With this curse, all living things within range which is the size of a small city, will slowly rot away. It will be fine if he finds a city filled with villains, but killing innocents for divinity isn't for him. But besides that, why was the holy relic with the mother's sealed divinity inside an incarnation? Was it really a coincidence? Or perhaps mother's divinity was one of the main forces in creating that thing? He suddenly waddles and falls down, noting that he received too many divinity-enhanced attacks. The mother comes up to him and begins crying. With that, he slowly drifts away, until he wakes up with Carmen taking care of him. His face grows dim, however, as mother is not next to him. He asks where his things is, and Carmen tries to calm him down, but he demands them right now. That's when Carmen hands him mother's hand, and it calms it down. He thought it might have some meaning for him, so when the others wanted to throw it in the trash, he took it. Marnak thanks him profusely, but Carmen notes that it's nothing compared to what he did. As if it weren't for his valiant sacrifice, he wouldn't have made it out of Kelton in one piece. Marnak asks where they are, and Carmen notes that they are still in Kelton. This causes Marnak to ask how long he slept for, and Carmen says that he did for ten days. Marnak asks if there were any survivors, and silence falls for a bit, until Carmen breaks it by saying that the only person who was left breathing in Kelton is him. Close to Kelton, a man tries to run from something but gets a knife to the leg. The other men shiver while the priestess walks towards the injured man. He desperately begs for his life, but she notes that he can't walk anymore due to his injury. The man says that he can, and his pleading continues, but it falls on deaf ears as the priestess decapitates and burns him whole. She looks behind and orders the other men to walk, so they do. That day, they arrive at Kelton's gates. The men, 
who were apparently a group of well-known criminals, called the Snowbear Bandits, fall to their knees and demand to be taken to jail. The priestess notes that they want this, and the guard agrees to take them. But the Lord of Kelton is dead, at the hands of some evil spirit worshippers, so it will take about a day for her to receive the rewards. She asks what happened to those worshippers, and the guard says that, including the monsters, Priest Marnak killed all of them. He was asleep for ten days due to the battle, but just woke up. The priestess asks if this Marnak, the supposed arch-enemy of evil spirit worshippers, is staying in Kelton right now. The spirits seem high inside of a local tavern, and the priestess asks if the supposed enemy of the evil worshippers, Priest Marnak, is here right now. The patrons, after hearing that name, start celebrating even louder, and especially him, as he was the one who saved this town. Their celebration is heard even from the outside of the town, where Carmen and Marnak bolt as fast as they can. He remembers what Fillion told him about that priestess, that she's looking for him basically everywhere she can, and seems to have absolutely no intention of giving up. He grits his teeth, as the only thing he can do now is run, and Mother urges him to be careful. He notes that he's very aware of the dangers. That's precisely why he left Kelton. It would have been plainly insane for him to stay there with that woman. He should have known already that this woman is the most dangerous among the humans he knows, as she was rate four and a half fingers. He thanks Carmen for agreeing to leave with such short notice, and in the night. Carmen says that he needn't worry, as he would much rather leave whenever they have the chance than garner even more attention from the city. Marnak smiles widely and thinks that he really likes this person and his personality. Two weeks later, while they are still traversing the plains, Carmen spots a carriage holding the crest of the Iramel family. Marnak asks if he's talking about the Iramel who's the High Lord of the South, and Carmen confirms it and notes that the white camellia flower is his family's crest. Marnak wonders if they should greet them, as to not seem impolite, but Carmen thinks otherwise, as they don't have the Lord's flag hung up so there must be a child or relative in that certain carriage. It might be better to just bypass them quietly. They do so, but when Marnak approaches the rear end of the carriage, he notices that something is amiss. He grabs Carmen's attention and tells him that there is somebody tied up inside of the carriage. The supposed carriage guards draw their weapons, as they have heard what they are whispering about, and one even says that if they would have played dumb, they would have continued their journey unscathed. However now, they have relinquished their right to live. They charge in, and a large shockwave appears. Marnak cut the head of one clean, and Carmen killed another with a perfect headshot. This paralyzes the other kidnappers, and Marnak asks how dare they swing their sword in such a crooked way. He tells Carmen that there are only eight kidnappers left. Their commander screams at them from a safe distance, and demands they finish things off quickly, as they don't have the time for things like this. There are only two anyways. They just need to charge in all at once. They do so, but a few short moments later, the leader is shot in the head by Carmen, as he is the last to stand from the kidnappers. The lady who was kidnapped keeps throwing up, and Carmen asks if he was able to get a name out of her. Marnak pats her back, and explains that he would like to. But this isn't a situation where he can ask any type of question. He doesn't know if she was drugged or something, but she can't move around that well, for now at least. Carmen asks if her eyes had a golden hue to them, and Marnak confirms it, noting that she's most likely a lady from the Iramel family. She demands he stop patting her back, as he is making her throw up even more. She raises her head up, and thanks them for saving her, while also making introductions. She is the eldest daughter of Kalto Iramel, the smiling young master. Her name is Dakia Iramel. Carmen thinks that if she's speaking the truth, and she's really the daughter of the smiling young master, she is most definitely a mage. Marnak thinks that if she's a noble and also a mage, she will be incredibly rude. Carmen notes that they can leave that for later, and whispers to Marnak that she has a really big heart, which he agrees with, and Mother curses at the both of them. Dakia grabs their attention, and notes that she would like to know the names of the ones who managed to save her, although she can see clearly that one of them is a priest. Marnak introduces himself as a priest that worships the goddess of preservation. She notes that his name isn't that bad, and also asks for his assistance, as she still has difficulty walking, because the gas that they made her inhale is still in her system. Carmen reaches his hand forward, and notes that he will help her in his stead. 
He is the son of Sir Enthus Valtus, Carmen Valtus. Dakia asks if he's sure about helping her, as if some nosy onlookers were to see the black prairie dog of the Valtus family traveling with her. The rumors will certainly spread even to the capital, and she's sure he has someone who is worried about in the capital. The least she can do for her saviors is be considerate, isn't that right? Both Marnax and Carmen's faces drop, as this woman is a noble, also a mage, and is capable of showing consideration for others. Carmen wonders if they can ask about how she got into that sort of situation in the first place, and she explains that she doesn't have any real evidence in regards of the real culprit, but she has a feeling. Actually, no. She's sure that this kidnapping was planned and paid for by her brother, who always despised her, Durso Irimal. Carmen is surprised that her brother would do something like this, and she explains that recently, she received a marriage offer from the Dragon Kingdom, and since she's the next in line for succeeding the title of Family Head, he wanted to use the offer as an excuse to get rid of her. Marnak thinks that might be one thing, but first and foremost, especially for nobles, mages are simply not welcomed at all. Nobles usually despise mages with all of their might, but to be more accurate, when it comes to noble families at least, they hate birthing mages into the family. The first, most obvious reason would be because of the natural tendencies mages hold. Teaching them any sort of manners is extremely difficult, but they also tend to be self-centered most of the time, and the power they gain for being nobles lead to accident that are hard to deal with. The second reason is why mages shouldn't be in control of power at all, because of an old and rather outdated folktale. The story is from before the ancient empire, and is passed down from generation to generation about the age of twisted mages. Due to a strong and otherwise dumb belief in the story, most species in the world hate having mages take position of real power. That is why when she told them that she was pursuing to become one of the High Lords of the Northern Kingdom, he presumed that, unless she were to kill her own flesh and blood, her brother, to take that powerful position, she wouldn't be able to do it. He is very intrigued on how she will carry out such an impossible task. Of course, that would be the case if she told the story once, at least. Dakia asks if they are paying attention to her story, and Carmen notes that, using excuse as a marriage, she suspects the people around her were trying to sell her off to the Dragon Kingdom. Isn't that right? She notes that he's correct, and Marnak explains that they tried their best to listen to her story, but she has already told it three times, so he hopes she understands why they are unable to focus on her that much. Also, while she has been focused on the story, her meat has been burning all of this time. He gives her his, and takes the burned one from her. Dakia thanks him for this show of kindness, and Marnak notes that she will do better at grilling the next time, but that can only happen if she reduces how much she talks when cooking. A little while later, Dakia asks if she can present the both of them with an offer. Marnak expected this already, and she says that she would like for them to take her to Beatus, which is part of the Iramel family territory. If they do so, she will pay the both of them their weight in gold. This takes Marnak by surprise, as he knew that High Lord families were something else entirely, but they are also very generous, it seems. However, with his current client being Carmen, if they are to escort the lady to Beatus, his journey of finding his long-lost mother will be delayed. He also managed to save mother's hand from being burned into nothing, so if he chooses to continue moving west, he will respect his choice and give up on the gold. The mother tells him to eat more to increase his weight, and Marnak can't believe she is this greedy. Even if she likes gold that much, would she like for her own son to be obese? Carmen clenches his fist and notes that he accepts the deal. Since they have decided to get involved further, they will take responsibility for everything until the end. That is the only way to live up the Valtus' name. The next morning, they get moving and arrive at a village, where they hope to bathe and relax in some hot water, as they have traveled quite a lot. They go to a tavern, and Carmen orders some rooms, while Marnak and Dakia talk about his bag. Carmen notes that their rooms are at the end of the third floor corridor, and even told them to prepare bath water. So they should hurry up and get washed, so that they may have a meal together. After they do that, they get at a table, and they have a feast lined up for themselves. Marnak thinks that in days like these, he would have wishes to have a sense of taste. Suddenly, he hears a commotion, as a few bar patrons are harassing a barmaid by grabbing her arm and telling her to stay here. Another man comes to the scene and demands he stop causing a scene at their establishment. 
The man wonders how he created a scene in the first place, as he didn't embarrass her or anything. All he did was try to ask her to pour more drink and listen to their story. Isn't that something she should do, since it's her job and all? Carmen notes that a fight will most likely break out, so should they go and help? Marnak says that one of them already went over there, so they most likely should. Dakia punches the harasser so hard he jumps from his chair and finishes him off with another attack. The man's friends are extremely angry at her now, but before they can do anything, Marnak takes care of them by slamming the head of one on the table, leaving him without a tooth and quite dazed. The bar workers clap while Dakia thanks Marnak, who notes that there is no need for thanks. Carmen tells her that she should tell them if she is doing something like this while strangling the last remaining harasses. He notes that they are a party, so they should act like one, right? Dakia explains that ever since she was little, she was unable to hold it whenever something unjust was going on. Marnak looks at her and thinks that she doesn't have an anger management issue, but rather a righteousness management issue. Carmen gives Marnak a coin bag from the harasser, and Marnak in turn gives it to the owner, as he can pay for the damages with this. The owner thanks him profusely, but Marnak says that it's not needed, as it's money from those idiots anyhow. Later that night, Marnak knocks on Dakia's door. When she opens it, however, he grabs her instantly and puts a knife near her head. From here on, she will listen and be quiet at all times to prevent Carmen from waking up, does she understand? She said that she can't let something that is unjust pass by, isn't that so? But she will have to ignore it the next time, as they are currently being followed and chased. They need to stop attracting the attention of others, so if she behaves like this ever again, he will have no choice but to injure her and hand her over to their pursuers. However, that would be too tragic, so he trusts that from now on she will discuss things she wants to do with him and act wisely. If she understands, she should nod, slowly. Dakia does so, and Marnak lets go, wishing her a good night. The mother notes that he is being way too hasty, and he understands where she is coming from, but this was something he had to bring up before a bigger problem came up. And now, they will find out whether Dakia Iramel really has an compulsive injustice disorder, like she claims. Inside of a mansion owned by the Dragon family, a younger member gets the news that they failed to capture Dakia, and if they really want to continue this quest, they will need more funds. The man scoffs at the idea of giving them extra money, as he already gave them plenty, and they showed no results. He tells him to come next to him, and slaps him hard. This chubby man is the secret world organization Ile Eastern Regional Manager, Hilden. The man demands an explanation as to why they need extra funds, and if he tells him it's because they took too many losses, he will be dead. Hilden thinks of his wife and children, and thinks that he must do anything to survive, for them at least. He bows down instantly, and notes that there is a priest that worships the goddess of preservation, and it's all because of him, who goes by the name of Marnak. The man wonders how a mere priest could put a stick in their plans so easily, and Hilden urges him to hear him out. He explains that Marnak is no ordinary priest, as he was the one who defeated the demon that turned into a gigantic monster in Guise, only using a single sword. And not long ago, in Kelton, he killed a monster that was created from the evil spirit worshippers, who sacrificed all the lives in Kelton for it, so it was quite powerful. He achieved all of this on his lonesome, thus earning the title of Evil Spirit's Arch Nemesis. So that rumored priest and Valtus' oldest son got hold of Dakia. The man notes that if the situation is like this, he will pay extra, but he hopes that they will succeed this time. This man is the Dragon Kingdom's third prince, Vatis Draco. Hilden is happy, as he did it, and can finally think of his wife and kids without thinking about his passing. Later that night, Marnak notes that he is filled with regret because of what he did to Dakia while feeding the mother, should he have been less harsh than he was. She seemed like somebody who would understand anyways. The mother tells him to not worry about other women, and Marnak notes that even if she is a woman, which he knows she despises, she is still their client. Suddenly somebody knocks at the door, and Marnak asks who it is. It is Dakia, and he invites her in. She slowly enters the room, and apologizes for interrupting, as it seems he was having a meal. Marnak notes that it's nothing to be worried about, and she asks if she can sit down, as she has something to talk to him about. They both sit down, and she asks if the reason he warned her like that was because she's a mage. Marnak looks downwards without responding for a second, and finally replies with yes. Dakia notes that she knew this was the reason, as the way he looked at her is something she is very used to by now. 
as most people have gotten hurt by mages, so they look at her with those kinds of eyes, weary yet spiteful. However, this experience was a first, as his eyes were filled with hatred towards her, but what he spoke of was about how to be a better companion, since they are traveling together and all that. Marnak blushes for a bit, and Dakia explains that most people who look at her with that distaste in her eyes try to do something bad to her. However, if she's honest, if she witnesses another unjust incident like the one that happened today, she won't be able to ignore it that easily. But from now on, she will make sure to discuss it with him, as he has suggested, since they are companions. She came her to tell him just that, so she will be taking her leave now. She wishes him a good night while he ponders the situation, but before she can leave he grabs her attention. He thinks that he acted quite harshly towards her, and was rude, so he would like to apologize. Dakia smiles deeply, and notes that this is the first time he's looking at her properly, with kind eyes, so she's very happy. Marnak asks if that is so, and she asks if they have made up now, without any grudges, right? Marnak says that it is so, as he isn't holding any grudges towards her. She winks at him, and notes that she is looking forward to where their adventure will lead them next. He feeds mother again, and thinks that in the end, mages are people, no matter what. This foolish son is finally facing the truth he had been avoiding all of this time. The mother says that he should stop talking about that and feed her more, which he laughs at. Later that night, a few goons swarm the tavern and demand that they hand over Marnak right this second, or everyone in this establishment will die. Inside of a camp, a man reads a message and notes that something is clearly off. Besides the request to capture the maiden of the Iramel family, who has silver hair and golden eyes, like everyone from her family does, what is the matter with this priest? To have the evil spirit's arch-nemesis title means that he must be priest Marnak, right? Suddenly, one of his subordinate, who calls him Sajita, notes that the priest they have been looking for is here, but the woman from the Iramel family isn't. He is surprised by this and asks where he is right now. Surely not starting a fight or anything, is he? Suddenly, they hear a scuffle going on outside, with a man demanding to be let go. Sajida goes outside and sees Marnak holding one of his subordinates by his neck. The others are ready with their swords, but Sajida orders them to drop them, as they do not know what they are doing. They hesitate, so he has no choice but to scream at them, demanding they do what he ordered now. Reluctantly, they withdraw their weapons, letting Sajida think that they were all slacking off when he was briefing about the request. Like the dumbasses they are, they are in so much trouble right now, it's not even funny. He approaches Marnak, and after a giant gulp, kindly asks if he is the priest Marnak there are so many good rumors about. Marnak says that he is indeed that priest, and Sajida pleads with him to let go of the thing that he is holding in his hand right now, as it is starting to foam at the mouth. Marnak does so, and notes that he would like to meet the captain of this mercenary corps. Sajida hesitates to answer for a bit, but explains that the captain of the Red Bear Mercenary Corps is right in front of him, and who he has been talking with all of this time. Sajida invites him inside and offers him some strong alcohol, but Marnak refuses, as he is not one to enjoy drinking, but he does appreciate the gesture. Sajida finds this quite annoying, as he was hoping to loosen his tongue and make the conversation much easier. Now he has no choice but to give up entirely on that idea. Marnak notes that he heard something from his colleague, who came looking for him this very morning. He said that he wanted to meet them, so is he wrong to think that this is regarding the scuffle that happened yesterday evening? Sajida smiles, and wonders what to do now. Get straight to the point, or test the waters with him a little while longer. By implying that their target is the maiden from the Iramil family, with silver hair and golden eyes, because they have been struck by a mighty curse from the organization called Ile. This situation is very difficult, as this priest is rumored to be a terrifying individual, and the rumors seem to be very true. He hates quarreling with him in any sort of way, but all of this is the fault of that damned vice captain, Pelguin. Suddenly, he arrives at the camp, clearly very drunk, and gets the news that the priest dropped by, which he finds extremely funny. He goes inside of the tent where Marnak and Sajida are exchanging pleasantries, and asks Marnak directly, Is someone from the Iramel family among his party? Marnak notes that indeed there is someone from that family, a woman to be exact. Pelguin says that this is great news, so he should listen here while he still can. He will hand over the woman and be allowed to leave, unless he wants to meet a gruesome death, that is. 
Marnak instantly pulls out his sword, and before Sajida can warn him, Pelguin gets his hand cut clean off. The hand lands on the ground, and he starts screaming from the pain, a scream which can be heard throughout the quiet mountains. Marnak finds this situation quite funny and strange. He doesn't remember ever telling him his name directly, yet here he is, saying it with such an affectionate tone. So, who was it? The person that wanted to track him and his party down? Sajida knows what's about to come, and is rightly horrified. A mercenary screams that their vice captain's hand has been cut off, so they will all make their way to Sajida's barracks and show the priest that they aren't pushovers. They all charge in, but the moment someone steps inside of that tent, their head gets cut clean off. This scares the mercenaries, but they steal themselves and surround the tent. Sajida looks at Pelguin, who is now completely sober, and begs him for help. Marnak raises his sword above him, and thinks that this sack of sadness won't be answering his questions anytime soon, so he has to dispose of him. Suddenly a spear appears and blocks Marnak's attack. He is quite surprised by this, as he didn't expect him to take action so suddenly. Sajida explains that he wasn't going to, but the relationship he and Pelguin share is a deep one, as they go fifteen years back. The mother urges Marnak to use caution, and Sajida tries to strike him with the spear. Marnak just cuts the tip of it when he gets the chance to making Sajida pull the tent over him as a last resort, which angers Marnak. He swings once, and Sajida runs as fast as he can while warning the others to do so as well. But it is much too late, as their heads start coming off one by one, from one single swing. The one with swift reaction time see this, and start running away from fear of getting their head getting cut off. Blood is spilled everywhere, and Sajida grabs another spear while damning this day. Mother orders Marnak to do something, but he already knows very well. No matter what, he will bring the one who ordered them to track his party down, to the tip of his blade. Sajida throws the spear at him with all of his might, but Marnak just blocks it with the corpse of one of the fallen mercenaries. He uses the sword to cut through him like butter, but Sajida manages to dodge in time and grabs another spear. He starts fighting Marnak one on one, and their weapons clash, creating a small shockwave. He orders his men to get Pelguin from the tent and treat him. While he is fighting the priest, they have plenty of time. Both of their weapons fly into the air, and Marnak uses this opportunity to charge up a deadly punch and strikes Sajida directly in the arm, making the snow around them fly in multiple directions. Marnak looks at him and smiles, since it has been quite a long while since he fought somebody of his level. Sajida grits his teeth and demands his men to fire. Marnak thinks that there was an archer all of this time and retreats from the fight, as if an arrow were to hit one of his joints. It would be extremely difficult to fight. They both sit in silence for a while, and when Marnak looks around, he spots that not a soul is around them. They are completely alone in this situation. The mother wonders what is going on, and Sajida screams at the bastards who dared abandon him like this. Marnak asks him if he is going to continue fighting, as he has been left behind without a thought. Sajida drops his spear and notes that he is surrendering. He will tell him everything. He only asks for his life to be spared. First they bury the dead. And when they get to Pelguin, Sajida notes that he always wanted to beat this bastard to a pulp one day. But now that he is actually gone forever, he feels strange. Marnak asks if he doesn't hate him now, and Sajida asks if he is going to be killed if he says that he does. Marnak asks if there is a good reason to keep a person which hates him alive, and Sajida smiles, saying that indeed he is right. He is also not great with words, so this will be quite hard for him. A mercenary's job is to kill and eventually be killed, so there were times when he had to work with guys who killed his companions earlier. Naturally, that didn't mean they were on friendly terms with them, but he also didn't run at them with an axe in hand to enact revenge. So he doesn't hate him at all. The fact is that he feels a bit lonely now. This mercenary group was failing anyways, so nothing of value was really lost. Marnak asks what he will be doing from now on, and Sajida notes that he doesn't know. It's been 15 years since he was completely alone like this, so he's a bit lost on what to do, as all he knows is how to fight. Most likely, he will end up doing mercenary work once again. Marnak ponders the situation for a bit, and notes that if things are like this, why doesn't he meet an employer that pays a lot? Sajida wonders what he's talking about, as this came out of the blue. Later, Dakia is quite mad, and Sajida just starts scratching his head. Marnak asks if there is some unwashed blood on him or something, but she notes that isn't it, as she washed up very well. Marnak notices her tone, and Mother screams at her. 
Marnak asks if she is acting like this because he left without saying a thing, and she notes that he is well aware why. After last night's deep conversation, Sho is certain they had established a much deeper bond, but it seems that she misunderstood it, right? He told her that she needed to discuss things with him before anything goes down, but this seems to not count for him, as without any sort of discussion, he left on his own accord. Marnak asks her if she has ever killed someone, which catches her by surprise. She notes that she hasn't, and Marnak explains that this is precisely why he went alone. He thought that had to be uncompromising regarding this situation, as there were fights that lead to much death there. Dakia notes that he could have at least told her, as she slept really well, and almost ate breakfast, without knowing a thing. Marnak thinks that he went alone, so she could do exactly that, but tells her that he will let her know from now on, no matter what. She accepts this apology, and notes that now, they are even. Suddenly, Carmen comes through the door, and notes that Marnak went to negotiate with the mercenaries on his own, so they should gear up and help. That's when he spots Marnak is safe and sound at the table, so he feels quite embarrassed now. Sajida waves at him, and Carmen asks who this might be. Marnak notes that it's just a new mercenary the princess hired, so they should introduce each other while they still can. Dakia notes that, even if he trusts this guy so much, she hopes nothing bad will happen between them. Sajida notes that nothing bad will happen. He promises that, and Carmen notes that he is quite happy to have a sturdier companion around. But now, he will go to the village smithy, as he ran here while choosing arrowheads, so he needs to get back to that. The sun is already up as it is, so they will take their leave early tomorrow morning. Nothing bad will happen in that time, right? Somewhere in Eratico, a girl starts whining about when they are coming. Just when is that going to be? A man asks if he is sure they are coming here, or at the very least that they arrive faster, before he goes insane from all of this needless whining. The girl is still on the ground and very impatient for their arrival. The other woman sighs, and notes that they will arrive soon enough, as she has been checking their location quite regularly, so she is certain. The girl comes next to her, and asks once again, is she really certain that they are coming here to Eratico? The woman says that she already told her plenty of times, so why doesn't she want to believe her? She explains that she believes her with all of her might, but if they do not come here soon, she is dead to her, and she will have to sadly mince her into small pieces and feed her to the dogs. Later, the party arrives at Eratico, which Dakia is extremely glad for. Now, she will be able to take a warm shower, something which she hasn't done in a while. A man spots them, and starts calling out for Marnak, as he saw his priestly attire. He asks if he really is a priest, and Marnak confirms that he is indeed one. The man grabs his hand tightly, and begs him with every fiber of his being, to go to the Trumpeter of Rest, as they don't even listen to the Lord at this point, and tell them to stop summoning the undead. He will pay for this handsomely. Marnak says that he doesn't think they would just stop, just because he told them to, as that would be too easy. The man notes that he is a priest, so he should at least try and talk to him. Carmen and Sajida look at each other with widened eyes. The man explains that he and his companions are all at their limits, as the undead walk around every night, like ghouls, and they are starting to become too terrified. So he begs him at least to talk with him, and ask him to stop this madness. Marnak ponders this situation, and notes that he will, but he shouldn't expect too much to change. The man thanks him as many times as his lungs allow him to and Marnak tells his party that he will be helping this man, and will catch up with them a while later, so they should go find some lodging. Dakia notes that they will do just that, and while walking through the dark forest, Marnak thinks that among the priests of the various gods in this world, the Trumpeter of Rest is the most unique, out of all of them. For other gods, they choose a priest that follows them, and grants them authority and power. But for the Trumpeter of Death and Rest, one eventful day, Without any rhyme or reason, they grant a random human authority and the power that comes with it. The Chosen Ones all go under the same title, Trumpeters of Rest, and they carry out their lives tending to the dead and all things related to that. Why would they do this? That is a mystery that hasn't been cracked to this day. The truth is that nobody truly knows. All anyone knows is that to awaken the dead from their eternal slumber, the Trumpeters appear where many corpses lie. They blow on their trumpets that make no sound at all, and walk around like a soldier, leading the dead. Of course, 
There were people in power who didn't like this phenomenon. That is a given. But nobody even dared to lay a finger on the undead lead by the trumpeters. It makes sense, though. As if one would go up against an army of undead that can raise infinitely, they would surely meet their end, as there is nothing they can do. With that, most if not all trumpeters of rest live their lives in complete solitude and go around with the undead, their true companions. They are something like a natural phenomenon that should be studied. Eventually he arrives at the trumpeter's location and greets him. The trumpeter doesn't speak a word, allowing Marnak to continue. He is sure that many have come and gone through here, but he wasn't in the position to reject this favor. He has simply come to say the same things as many others have. Doesn't he think that it's about time he hangs up his hat and leave this place for another? As he may already know, for most normal people, the moving undead is something very unpleasant and mortifying to witness. Or perhaps, is there another reason behind him wanting to remain here? They don't usually stay in one area for too long though, so that must be it. The trumpeter looks at him and says three words, evil spirit worshippers. They will be the ones who will cause many deaths. He points behind Marnak and notes that all of this will happen in Eratico. Marnak asks if there really are evil spirit worshippers in that town, and the trumpeter looks at him. Unfortunately for him, it has already begun. A giant beam comes out of the sky directly into the town, and Mother tells Marnak to hurry, as they don't have much time left. He thinks that this time, it won't be like Kelton, where everyone died. Things will not go however they want to. He promises this. The girl, who was a devil worshipper all of this time, screams that the toy she wanted to play with is not here. She said that he would be here, but he isn't. The woman notes that she verified that his companions have entered the city, so she only needs to wait for a moment, as they will find him soon enough. The girl demands she just die already, but the man urges her to stop, as he thinks that he just appeared. The girl turns around and asks where, and the man points him out. Marnak sits in the flames, and is utterly filled with rage. The girl is ecstatic that they finally found him, and Marnak begins smirking from ear to ear, as he didn't expect to meet these bastards in a place like this one. The man notices something, and Mother urges him to calm down. Marnak revs up his chainsword and ignores most of Mother's pleas, something which he hasn't done before. He thinks that she is correct, and he needs to calm down, but he is not going to care about dumb things like that this time. As he probably already knows, this mage bastard that is in front of him is someone who long ago killed his savior and him. He is somebody that he needs to take revenge on, no matter what happens. Way back then, when he didn't have anything, except many unnecessary worries, he lived every day trying to earn something, and on the days that he couldn't hope to earn enough, he had to starve, no matter how hungry he was. On a day like that, which was quite common for him, and when the blizzard was unusually intense for the time, he met his savior, Shantux. He was a peculiar looking person, as he wasn't really middle-aged, nor was he that old either. Shantux was very easygoing, but when necessary, he proved that he can be serious about things. When he woke up, he didn't ask him a single thing. All he did say was that he could stay as long as he needed, until he fully recovered and is ready to leave. He was a priest who worshipped one of the gods, the goddess of preservation, and additionally, a grave keeper who lived on the outskirts of a nearby town. One eventful day, while helping him in his grave keeping duties, he got really curious and asked why he saved him, and without asking for anything in return, he gently smiled and answered with this, because he just wanted to, that is all there is to it. That warm smile, full of forgiveness and love, hold a special place in his heart, even to this day. Shantux was a treasure of a man, as he always helped and helped, without asking for anything in return. He always said that one should never need a reason to help others. And well, after that, he wanted to become more like him, kind. One year into that peaceful and kind life, in the winter to be precise, he saved a man who was passed out in the snow, the same position that he was in not long ago. He remembered how Shantuck saved him, and of course tried to be like him and help. But that's when he made a mistake that haunts him to this day as he should have never saved that disgusting mage. Upon receiving their most kind help, the mage had healed up fully, and with a sinister smile on his face, he confessed right in front of him that he was a worshipper of the evil spirits. After that, with rather simple magic, he ripped him into shreds 
while still holding that sinister smile on his face. When he surprisingly woke up once again, the hand that he stored away out of curiosity had somehow escaped his inventory and started emitting a green energy while also gently caressing his cheek. After that, naturally, he went to check inside of the house and had to face the dire consequences of his foolish actions. What he found inside was the corpse of his dearest friend Shantux, who had been slaughtered quite cruelly by that bastard of a mage. Marnak revs up his sword, which is now engulfed with raging fire, representing his inner rage. The mage finally remembers him after thinking for a while. He is that gravekeeper, whom he brutally murdered just because he was bored. However, he is pretty sure he died back then, as he killed him with a spell quite easily. Well, he is alive now, so all of this talk is becoming rather pointless, to be honest. By the by, that priest outfit was worn by the other gravekeeper, but it seems that that he is wearing it now. Oh, and his arm. It was this very arm that is attached to him right now, right? He has been using it very well for the past three years, and it has treated him quite nicely. This angers Marnak a lot, as he has held a grudge against this man all of this years, yet not. He mocks him like he did all those years ago. The girl rushes next to him, and notes that she heard he was very, very strong. She has been waiting for someone like him. In the second that she gets into cutting distance, Marnak cuts her clean in half, and clashes with the mage's barrier. He notes that he is quite different from the rumors they have heard, and Marnak demands he stop talking, while the runes on his face glisten a fluorescent green. Mother urges him to finish this, and he finds enough force to break through the barrier, allowing him to cut off the hand that was stole from him at that time. The girl, who seems to be just fine now, notes that she really likes somebody like him. Marnak is surprised by her presence and takes no time in cutting her head off, which she finds to be a fun activity. The mage activates scales of retribution on his leg, and Marnak waits to see what all of that is about. The mage stomps the ground with all of his might, while brandishing his iconic evil grin, and an explosion that looks like a cross occurs. This pushes even the woman behind him back, and it creates a large electrified smoke cloud afterwards. Marnak seems to have been hit by this attack, as he is slumped on the ground. The mage explains that the divine power he can sense from him isn't from the goddess that the other gravekeeper worshipped, the goddess of preservation. However, the blessing on that priest outfit works very well, so he also must have become a worshipper of an evil spirit just like him. Marnak looks at him with rage-fueled eyes and tells him to shut his trap, but this confirms to the mage that indeed, this is what he became, the very thing he swore to destroy one day. Marnak summons the giant beast and tells him one last time to shut up. The mage finds his authority quite interesting, but well, since his left arm is missing once again, he can take one of theirs. That would be just perfect. The beast tries to punch him, and a large green explosion occurs at the landing, but Marnak sneers, as the mage has simply blocked the attack and is now smiling like a bastard. Marnak slowly gets up and promises himself and to Shantux that tonight, he will kill that mage, which goes by the name of Riverkel, no matter what it takes. Somewhere else in the town, Marnak's party take care of the zombified people, who are now yearning for flesh. Dakia asks Sajida about the zombie, and if it's dead or not. Sajida confirms that indeed, this thing is not dead just yet, and Carmen tells them both that they should hurry to the castle, as that might be the only place where they can take some refuge. Dakia asks about Marnak, as she is worried he might also be caught up in all of this mess. Sajida explains that Marnak is a man who wouldn't die so easily because of something like this, so they need to prioritize themselves right now and find a way to get out as fast as possible. Eventually, throughout the fires, rubble and bodies scattered around everywhere at this point, they arrive at the Lord's castle. Carmen notices that the castle is unharmed, so it wasn't the Lord's fault that everyone became like this, zombified. Sajida grabs their attention, especially Dakia's, and tells her that no matter what, even if there is a way to bring these people back, right now, they need to kill them. One comes around and Sajida stabs it clear in the chest, killing it instantly, and most likely painlessly. If they ever want to escape this trap of a city, they need to keep killing, and killing, even if these people revert back when they do so. If she truly wants to live, and see Marnak once again, she needs to regard this as thought she is just stabbing some meat and not people. A horde rushes to their location, as they have heard the commotion, 
and Sajida notes that he will be taking the lead, but they both shouldn't falter behind either. Dakia suddenly smiles and pulls out her blade, slashing the first zombie that comes around. Carmen is glad that Sajida encouraged her like this, and with that, they all make their way to the castle gates. However, while fighting, Sajida notices something. A strange beast and a purple light among the countless zombies that are coming towards them. He also sees Marnak after the dust clears and wonders if it really is him. The girl pops up behind Riverkel and notes that this is very exciting to watch and wonders just how far this man can go. She really, really wants to know. The woman suggests that they talk things through, considering they are all evil spirit worshipper, but the girl denies this notion as she has been waiting to meet this man for a very long time, so now she can't miss all of the action. Marnak doesn't react in any specific way and tells the beast to attack. It does. So, and with a mighty punch and a large roar, it breaks Riverkel's barrier into small pieces. This allows Marnak to charge in, and they both are ready to battle, each in their own way. Almost like a dance, they dodge and strike at the same time. After some time, Riverkel mocks Marnak, as he has only thrown that sword around and used his fists. Doesn't he have anything else in his arsenal? Mother tells Marnak something, and Riverkel tells him to calm down a bit, as this isn't nearly as over as he thinks it is. That's when a spear appears, lunging straight for Riverkel's head. He doesn't notice it at all, and it hits him, taking his head clean off. Marnak's eyes widen, as his object of obsession is gone, and he also recognizes the spear. He looks in the direction it was thrown from, and he sees Sajita, who threw the spear. They both look at each other, before Sajita is swarmed by zombies, so he has to bolt it out of there. Marnak stands there, unshaken. He has read somewhere that truly, revenge is futile. But even with this, he didn't expect it to be like this, so worthless and empty. Naturally, he wasn't expecting something dramatic with a grand ending, but he also didn't want the ending to be so abrupt and lonely. With all of this out of the way, he offers Mother the corpse, but that's when Riverkill's body starts to surge with divine power. This makes Marnak think that somehow, he is still alive, even after his head was taken off. So he revs up his sword and takes back that right arm before anything. The woman screams that they are extremely screwed right now. This is why she told them that they should have resolved this through words rather than their own fists. The girl is ecstatic as this is very fun for her and asks Marnak to do that slashing thing again before the woman drags her away with her. She tells her to shut up already as when Riverkel is in that state, he can't differentiate between friend or foe so he is extremely dangerous. Marnak, after hearing this, tells the beast to toss him over to those two. Afterwards, he can return back to his domain. The beast obliges and picks him up. The girl demands that she be let go, as she will seriously kill her if she doesn't. The woman demands that she just shut up at this point, as she is extremely loud for no reason. Suddenly something passes them and lands on front of them, which makes the woman worry. She looks to see what it is, and she confirms that indeed, it is Marnak, who asks what is going to happen now, that they are in this situation. The girl comes from behind the woman, and notes that she will be telling him. Her name is Pearly, while this short-haired woman is named Bina. The woman tries to plead with her to stop speaking, but the girl continues to explain that they are what one would call a secret society of evil spirit worshippers. They go by the name of Liberatio. If he searches around his noggin, he can probably remember the other evil spirit worshippers that he has killed previously in Kelton. Marnak notes that he remembers all of them quite clearly, and Pearly explains that all of those people were also part of this organization, Liberatio. This is also the main reason they have been patiently waiting for him in this place. Marnak walks towards them and asks how many people their organization has. Pearly says that she doesn't know, and Bena doesn't do either. She came here only because she was allowed to do everything she wanted to. If H wants answers, he should ask Riverkel directly, as he was dispatched directly from Liberatio to carry out an important mission here. Though right now, he might not answer, as he is in quite a peculiar state. Marnak asks what the goal of this organization might be, and Berna steps up, noting that she will be the one to tell him. Their goal is a simple and righteous one. It is to create a world where it doesn't matter what god one chooses to worship. A world where people aren't persecuted, just because they chose to worship a god that the world thinks is evil. Marnak asks why they burn this village down then. 
Will this help their cause in any way at all? Berna says that she didn't want for things to become like this either, and it's mostly because Riverkel liked to cause a lot of trouble. The only reason they came to this village is because they have some things to collect, and one of them he possesses. Marnak asks what item she might be talking about, and Berna notes that she is talking about the Holy Relic, the marble that was in the body of the Incarnation. Marnak tightens his grip on his chainsword and thinks that his assumptions about all of this was correct. Using the holy relic that possesses Mother's primordial power, these people want to do something with that power. But what? Marnak tells them that the marble they wanted simply broke, and Berna thinks that he is lying, as something so precious couldn't just break so easily. Marnak notes that it did, even if it is that precious, and he left the remnants somewhere in Kelton, basically throwing it away. Marnak also asks if there is only one of them, and Mother listens intently. Berna is hesitant to answer that question, but Pearly screams that there are four more, which makes Mother scream in rage. This is only natural, as she is the owner of that sealed power, so she is rightfully angry because of this. Berna scolds Pearly for telling him all of this information for free, but Pearly says that he was going to find out anyways, since he is on their side. God, can she be petty or what? Marnak smiles at the notion of them having four more, and he wants to ask something. Who is the one who drove all of the citizens in here to insanity? Pearly immediately notes that it wasn't her, as she doesn't know how to do something like that, and Berna tries to scold her for telling him all of this so easily, but she doesn't get to, as Marnak cuts her head off without remorse. Pearly is quite surprised by this, and Marnak also cuts her head off, but she doesn't seem to be phased, and notes that they will be seeing each other in the future. Marnak offers the corpses to Mother, but only Barna's corpse is swallowed, as Pearly seems to still be alive somehow. However, now that the cause of all this is eliminated, this village has become pleasantly quiet. Suddenly Carmen calls him over, as everyone who was zombified suddenly fell over on the ground. Was it perhaps his doing? Marnak confirms that indeed it was, and Sajida asks if his spear was of any help. Marnak explains that it was much more helpful than he would expect as even he was overwhelmed by how helpful it was. Sajida says that he is glad to have helped him out this much, and Marnak hopes that he didn't see the gigantic corruption beast helping him. He tells everyone that they need to get moving, as something big will be awakened very soon. They are all quite puzzled by his words, and Carmen asks what he means, but that's when the ground starts to rumble, and the air is filled with death. An amalgamation of every corpse around here rises, and wants only one single thing to kill. Marnak looks closer at it, and his expression dims, as this creature is made entirely out of corpses. Marnak notes that this is what he was referring to when he said something big was coming, and thinks that Riverkel has an extremely annoying hobby. Even after his demise, he gathered all of the corpses in this village, and took on this disgusting and rather pathetic form. It is an authority that fits an ugly person like him perfectly. Mother agrees with his assumption and Marnak tells Dakia that he knows she is quite sad that she had to bloody up her hands like this, but he will comfort her once they are done with this. So for now, she needs to be strong. Dakia smiles and asks how he will be comforting her. Marnak notes that he will be thinking about that, as firstly, in order to save the people remaining, they need to stall for time. Carmen asks if somebody will be coming to help them if they were to stall for time, and Marnak confirms that, yes, he is sure that a certain someone will be coming. The trumpeter arrives at the village gates, and Sajida notices him. He notes that the person he wanted to wait for, it already here. The trumpeter blows his horn, and the undead he herded in here jump into action, and they all rush to beast that is made up of bodies. Slowly but surely, they all climb up and feast on its flesh. The beast can't do anything to retaliate, and only howls. The four look at this sight, and Dakia notes that it seems the person who herded the undead is coming in their direction. Marnak notes that he is doing just that, and the trumpeter stops when he is in speaking range. He asks, between the four of them, he would like the most agile of the group to take this spear that he is holding and stab the heart of the beast with it. Marnak picks up the spear from the trumpeter and asks if he perhaps also has a sword. He looks at Marnak in silence, and shortly afterwards, hands him a sword bearing the same style as the spear. Marnak is pleasantly surprised about him being able to create things so fast, and asks if he can also create two more swords and some arrows with them. The trumpeter looks at him, 
perhaps peeved about his constant requests under the mask, and summons the respective items, while telling Marnak to say what he wants all at once, as they don't have this much time to waste. They all get equipped, Sajida with the spear, Carmen with the bow and arrow, and Dakia with one of the swords. She swings it around, and notes that it is quite light, and Marnak also thinks the same, it is a good weapon. Its sharpness is nothing to scoff at, as it is made purely out of bones, and it is also imbued with the divinity of the trumpeter. Against the undead, and especially against such a disgusting beast, it will be very effective. The trumpeter comes next to him, and explains that he will be stopping that being's movements for a while. During that time, they will be attempting to stab the giant's heart, and hopefully succeeding. Should they do, their rewards will be the very weapons they hold right now. Marnak agrees, and so the trumpeter blows his horn, while they all get ready for battle. The noise starts vibrating throughout, and when it reaches the beast, who is still being assaulted by the undead, they explode into liquid, which covers the beast. Dakia looks at this, and notes that the trumpeter is basically melting the corpses, the very same he brought. Marnak watches all of this with a certain disdain, as the beast starts to convulse all around as it tries to move. He understands more than Dakia, as the trumpeter is melting the corpses only to solidify them once again. For him at least now, he is worse than any of the evil spirit worshippers. The trumpeter tells them that he only handles the bodies, who have now been presented with rest. The weapons will tell them where the heart resides, so they should run, and finish this as fast as they can. Marnak thinks that he would have liked to say more about this, but right now, there's just not enough time, as they have an important task to fulfill. They all run towards it, especially Marnak, who thinks that if they postpone this situation even further, things will turn bad. The beast tries to punch them, but misses due to it being stuck in place, which makes Dakia run even faster. That's when the corpses from the beast try to descend upon her, which takes her by surprise, but Carmen is there to help her, and he clears out every corpse that was approaching. This makes her confident, and she screams that she will work with Carmen in order to bring down the beast from down below. Marnak agrees, and tells Sajida, who is right next to him, to pierce the heart if he can, as he will distract the head while he does that. Sajida agrees, and so they both go into different places. The beast tries to stop them with the countless bodies it has amassed, but they do not hold a candle to their skills. However, there is a reason that Marnak aimed for the head specifically. Mother told him that there is a chunk of divinity in the middle of the head, and as a clear bonus, that chunk of divinity is plastered on the head of the man who took away one of his dearest friends, that disgusting mage, Riverkill. Sajida gets hard at work trying to find the heart, and Marnak fights that disgusting bastard for one last time. He charges up a sword attack with all of his might, and slashes the head everywhere, leaving only a single eye left, which Marnak also takes care of with ease. He destroys every single shred of what remains, and can now say that he avenged his friend as he should have, by destroying Riverkill utterly. Eventually, Sajida finds the heart, pierces it, which makes the beast instantly react. Dakia notices that countless bodies begin falling from the sky as the beast is slowly coming apart, and eventually, it explodes into a pool green substance, and the matter from the bodies falls to the ground. Marnak watches from below while he holds the orb that holds divinity. With this, he has come out victorious and the memory of his friend is now a pleasant one. Dakia and Carmen come next to him, and ask if he is hurt in any way. Marnak, in turn asks where Sajida is, who instantly comes around too, while admiring the spear he is holding. The trumpeter arrives at their location, and tells Marnak to come with him, but only him, nobody else. While they walk around to another, more secretive area, Marnak wonders why he would wish to speak with only him. Did he perhaps find out that he took the marble? Or the fact that he is an evil spirit worshipper? Suddenly the trumpeter stops walking, and Mother tells Marnak to get ready. That's when the trumpeter tells him that it's coming, and Marnak can feel it too. This presence, he knows exactly what it is. It is truly overwhelming, and it is of a much higher being, beyond what humanity can even imagine. A part of God has descended to their mortal plane. The trumpeter of death and rest arrives and looks at Marnak before pointing at him and saying a single word. Capital. With that he leaves, making the trumpeter slowly come to his senses while the possession dies down. 
Marnak is surprised that he vanished after only saying one word. Marnak stands above the trumpeter and asks if he has something to say. The trumpeter looks down and tells him that he cannot know and does not really wish to. This makes Marnak smile and he offers him a helping hand while noting that they should go back. While they do so, Marnak asks if it is possible for him to clean up around this place, as the undead he commands would prove really useful. At first, the trumpeter tells him that helping the living isn't one of his sworn duties, but he gets hit with a strange feeling, the same one he felt when he was possessed. He asks what he can help with, and Marnak explains that he only needs to find the survivors and move them to the stable buildings. The trumpeter blows his horn, and the undead begins moving once again, which spooks Dakia a bit but she calms down shortly after. Marnak also requests the trumpeter to move any useful goods to the buildings too, as he would be grateful for that. If they are left behind like this, they would just end up burned or stolen, so they should do what they can to preserve them. The trumpeter once again blows his horn, and instantly afterwards, Marnak asks him to also put out the fires. Now, even the oddly calm trumpeter is a little angry at him not requesting all of this at once. Eventually, all of the work is done, and while the trumpeter gets ready to leave, Marnak gives him the right arm of an evil spirit worshipper. The trumpeter looks at it for a few good seconds before leaving with the dead into the distance. Dakia notes that she would have never guessed that a trumpeter would help them, as they are extreme recluses, and Marnak notes that he was just a very nice and kind person. She says that he probably also asked him for help, and Marnak confirms that he did, but he never expected him to actually do. Dakia grabs his hand and thanks him, as what he did was really helpful. Mother is now screaming kill, which to be fair, is understandable. Later that night, while staying at an inn, Mother appears in her full form, while trying to take out the divinity out of the orb, but she is struggling quite a bit. Marnak ponders what happened, and wonders what the trumpeter wanted to say with pointing at him and saying capital. Did he perhaps mean that there is a holy relic situated in the capital? However, if that is the case, it would mean that he knows he is a priest of corruption, which might be dangerous. He asks Mother if she knows the god that they met earlier today, the one with a strange appearance, but she tells him that she doesn't know a thing about him. This makes Marnak think that what the trumpeter said about him not wishing to know what he asked means that his identity shouldn't be revealed, as a god wouldn't just start to speak about something like this with other people. But just why would he contact him like this? What is his real purpose? Mother gets extremely angry at the orb and throws it around in anger, much to the dismay of Marnak. She explains that she is having great difficulty with severing the divinity from the marble, but Marnak tells her to not worry so much, as he is confident she can do it. However, even if she is very angry, throwing things around is not a good way to express it. Mother notes that she just wanted to be more useful for him, which Marnak is extremely grateful for, but she shouldn't throw things around, no matter how frustrated she might feel. She doesn't need to worry, as she will be three times more charming than she already is when she finally cracks it. Mother asks if she will be charming to him too, after she accomplishes that. But Marnak says no, which shatters her whole world. Marnak pleads with her to listen until the very end, but she is already crying. Marnak explains that she is already extremely charming to him, so it is all the same to him whether she is three times or three hundred times more charming than she is right now. Mother promises to not throw objects around anymore, and so, the issue is solved. At a tavern in an undisclosed location, the priestess listens as two men are having a conversation about evil spirit worshippers, who seem to be all over the place lately. Not just in this kingdom, but also in the East Kingdom, the Desert Kingdom, and the Northern Empire also. And additionally, Kelton and Eratico have also suffered greatly because of the evil spirit worshippers, so is their city also in danger? One explains that they shouldn't worry about that, as there was someone who killed all of them, in both Eratico and Kelton. This is all thanks to Marnak, who saved both of those cities. They cheer for Marnak and his exploits, while the priestess ponders all of this information and finds it quite interesting. Hilden walks through the halls and damns the situation, as he just barely managed to convince the Lord of Eratico to catch the princess. But thanks to those evil spirit worshipper bastards, everything went down the drain. Now, he can only hope that the Dragon Kingdom Prince doesn't take his inevitable anger out on him. 
However, he will be more furious if he doesn't show up, so he has to, no matter what. Hilden knocks at the door of the chambers, and the prince demands he enter, while looking at the door quite angrily. Somewhere else entirely, a bandit tries to plead for his life while Marnak holds the blade to his neck. The bandit says that he will give them absolutely everything that he owns, which doesn't please Marnak, and so, he kills him. Dakia is clearly not happy with all of this bloodshed, and Marnak says that he will bury them, at least. He does so, but also secretly offers them to Mother, and it seems that he has amassed almost 4,000 divinity. All of this was mostly because of the numerous bandits that dared attack them. With this out of the way, they continue their journey. But suddenly, Dakia comes closer to Marnak, as she has something to ask him. She isn't blaming him for anything, so he shouldn't take this the wrong way, but he never lets any of the bandits go. She just wants to know why, is all. However, if he doesn't want to talk about it, he doesn't have to say anything. Marnak sighs and smiles at the same time. He asks if she also asked Carmen and Sajida, and she confirms that she did. Carmen told her that, since they attacked them first, and they were clearly armed and willing to bring harm, they most likely go after innocent people too, and that is something that he can't let happen. And Sajita, like usual, said that he is only fulfilling his duty, but he can try to spare them, if that is what she wishes to. Marnak notes that, in his case, he believes in the potential of people. Dakia is quite puzzled by this, but asks if he is talking about how even those bandits can be reborn in some way. Marnak confirms that it is precisely so. He firmly believes that even those bandits have the possibility to repent and start living good lives without bloodshed and peace. Dakia angrily asks why he isn't sparing them, and Marnak explains that the first time is always hard for anything in life, so it is more likely that they will go down the path of darkness once again than repent. That is why he kills them without mercy. Dakia ponders the situation heavily and asks if they really have the right to bestow judgment upon them like this. Even the gods, who seems omnipotent, don't seem to have a clear vision about this topic. Mother speaks with Marnak, but he already knows, so she shouldn't worry. She gave him the authority to do as he wishes. Marnak says that he is not killing them to bestow judgment, but he is only taking responsibility for the choices he has made. If he spares any evil, and that evil once again commits evil, harming innocent lives in the process. Some of the responsibility would wait on his shoulder afterwards, so he would much rather bear the responsibility for taking their lives and chance at repenting for their actions. He has no idea about what he might pay for committing so many killings, but no matter what it is, this is the choice that he has made, and he has to live with it, no matter what. To spare an evil man, who then goes on to murder innocents, is something that, in his eyes at least, is unforgivable. He thinks that if he can't take that responsibility until the very end, then, no matter how much potential an evil person has for change, he promised to himself that day that he will never spare any of them. Dakia fiddles with her hair for a bit and asks if he can perhaps tell her why he thinks like this, only if he wants to, of course, as she isn't forcing him into anything. Marnak says that he certainly will, but they will probably have to save it for later as a group of merchants is arriving. Sajida recommends that they meet them, as they will certainly have a variety of useful items, and they also might be able to sell the equipment from the bandits to them. They do so, and much later, while in a camp set up by the merchants, one of them analyzes Marnak's sword with great excitement. As the metal it is made out of is extremely nice, it is an immortal alloy that was imbued with the essence of the ancient empire and its technology. What this sword is made out of is Immortalium, which is exceedingly rare. Carmen notes that he must be talking about the Medal of Immortality, but the merchant is extremely excited, as it is more Immortalium than he has collected for well over 120 years. He would like to buy it, no matter the cost, but Marnak tells him that he is not selling it. The merchant understands it full well, and Carmen says that he must have another reason for inviting them to stay here. The merchant explains that he would like to employ them as his guards until they all reached the Northern Kingdom's capital. They mentioned that they went through Eratico, which was almost eradicated entirely. So then, he, who wears the priestly robes, must be Gisa's demon slayer, the arch nemesis of the evil spirits themselves, Marnak. He is embarrassed by all of this praise, and the merchant explains that 
Should they accept this job, they will all be rewarded well and promises better treatment than the other mercenaries they have employed. Carmen asks for some time to discuss it amongst themselves, and the merchant gives them that time, but looks forward to them accepting the offer. Later that night, while Marnak is giving a massage to Mother, he notes that, since they accepted this well-paying job and all, they should look for a nice place to live once they have the money. Suddenly, screams can be heard from the outside, as countless giant bats have invaded their camp. Marnak protects Mother, and is prepared to face anything for her. The large bats continue their attacks, with the party trying their best to defend the merchants, specifically Marnak and Carmen, who are in the front lines. Dakia also tries to help a merchant by attempting to shoot a fireball, but before she can even gather enough mana to do it, a sword appears into the bat's head, and the merchant runs freely. The sword was thrown by Marnak, who wanted to stop Dakia, and succeeded, as if she doesn't know how to control her spell, she might have caused a lot of damage. Dakia gets angry, and notes that it's not so bad as it seems. Maybe she could have just hit one of the bats in the air, if she aimed well. Marnak says that, even if it is so, bats can fly, and they are much harder to predict in the air. There is no real guarantee that a magic spell that missed its target won't find another, maybe even an ally, so he asks her to stop herself from casting spells from now on. Dakia continues to pout, but agrees that it is dangerous. Marnak finds his way to the merchant leader, with the sword still unsheathed, which is dripping blood on the carpet. The merchant notes that he would like for him to put that rather handsome sword in its sheath, but Marnak explains that it will depend on his answers. The merchant sees what's going on, and notes that, if this is the case, he better answer wisely. Marnak tells him that he really should think before answering, as this might become messy. His first question is why are evil spirit worshippers attacking a merchant organization so out of the blue? The merchant tries to play it off, saying that he doesn't really know, but when Marnak revs up his sword, he gives up, and notes that he will trust him with this information, since he is so renowned. With that, Marnak is satisfied, and so, he sheathes his sword, while hoping that the merchant is not hiding anything more than this. He asks if he will keep all of this a secret, and Marnak agrees, as he is a mercenary, and is willing to keep secrets. The merchant asks one of his subordinates to bring him the thing, and he does so, a small golden box. The merchant explains that the evil spirit worshippers began their attacks after a certain item, this one to be exact, was handed over to them. They were requested to bring this item straight to the capital. Marnak notes that, since it has been so long since they have gotten the request, they must have faced many casualties. So the question is, why didn't they just give up on the request? The merchant tells him that they received Immortalium as payment up front, and they were promised even more once the delivery was complete. If he's being truly honest, he doesn't know why they would want something like this, and he asked another priest for his advice, but he did not know anything. He presents to Marnak the item, a necklace of sorts, which shines heavily under the light. Marnak instantly feels that this is a holy relic, one that contains the divinity of Mother. This must be why the evil spirit worshippers want the item so much, but how did they even find out about it? He has Mother's hand, so how are they finding out where all of her holy relics are? The merchant also asks for his opinion on the item, since he is also a priest, but Marnak lies, and tells him that he also has no clue. Now, he understands the situation they are facing, but they should talk about something even more important. The merchant asks if this is about the conditions, and Marnak confirms that it is. Since he has hidden something from them, which put them at risk, he thinks that it's only natural that they change the conditions. They will need twice the amount of money that he promised them, for everyone, not just him. The merchant reluctantly agrees, and notes that instead of a priest, he should have become a merchant. The party meets inside of a storage tent, and Sajida congratulates Marnak for finding out, as there were plenty of traces around here that battles have been fought, especially on the soldiers' equipment. They must have fought plenty already, so it's no wonder why it is so. Dakia says that he should have told all of them this, but Sajida explains that it was the merchants who chose to keep it away from their ears, and since they were going basically in the same direction, they would have been caught up in the ambush anyways, even if they rejected the offer. Carmen says that, in addition to all of this, their most benevolent priest was ahead, and doubled their reward money with ease. Marnak notes that he just got them what they rightly deserve, and with that, everyone goes to their individual tents, as they have a lot to travel still. 
After taking a well-deserved bath, Marnak walks around in the night, and Mother suggests that they steal the relic now. He notes that it would be terrible if he was caught doing it, but Mother reassures him, saying that as long as there are no witnesses, it's not a crime. This doesn't inspire that much confidence into Marnak, who explains that they should hold back on doing things of the nature until they figure out what that sly merchant is capable of, at least. She knows already that metal doesn't rot, so they will simply let the evil spirit worshippers take the item, and in the process of graciously retrieving it, they will just steal the divinity inside and give it back, like nothing ever happened. The mother did not think of this, and tells him that he is extremely smart. Marnak tries to continue talking with her, but that's when one of the soldiers screams that another ambush is taking place, which Marnak laments as he just got done cleaning himself. A large bipedal creature with devilish horns charges forwards and instantly takes care of the soldiers, who couldn't do much in the first place. It goes straight to Marnak, who recognizes the creature as a carpal, and so he prepares a wide attack, putting all of his force behind it. When the creature gets close enough, he unleashes it, but surprisingly the beast has very tough horns, and they block his sword. Marnak continues to push, however, and eventually he manages to cut through the horn and decapitate it. With that finished, something else catches his attention, as a bush is radiating pink energy. Something jumps out of it and instantly goes for him. In that split second, Marnak manages to catch the woman that was ready to pounce on him. It is one of the evil spirit worshippers that he has met previously, Pearly, who is excited to finally meet him again. She notes that she thought about him a lot. Did he perhaps do the same? Marnak confirms that he didn't think about her a single time, but she says that it's okay, as she thought about him enough times, so much so that it makes up for him not doing it. Marnak laments having to deal with this pipsqueak again, and notes that there is something he would like to ask her. In turn, she asks him what she will receive for this information. Marnak continues to take care of the beasts that attack them, and the party also comes out to help, which makes things a whole lot easier for Marnak. Carmen spots that one of the beasts is trying to get away, and Marnak offers himself to take care of it. And so, he gets running for it, but the beast is fast, and it doesn't seem that he can catch up by normal means. He chooses to throw the other sword at it, and it manages to hit, killing the beast instantly. With that done, he walks away, to the spot where Pearly is, who is quite mad that he is late. But now that he is here, will he be granting her wishes? Marnak doesn't know what she's talking about, and notes that first, she will be answering his questions. She agrees, and Marnak asks how many evil spirit worshippers are a part of this ambush. Pearly gets to counting, and comes to the conclusion that there are three, excluding her of course. However, they make her a bit mad, as they are all acting like she is not here, which is very mean, if she's being honest. Marnak thinks that she's just telling the enemy all of this information for free basically, so if she were an ally, he also would just ignore her. He agrees with her that they are mean, and also asks why they are attacking the merchant group, although he already knows. She says that it's because of the necklace that the merchant leader has, which makes Marnak asks how she knows about the item in the first place. She tells him that she hasn't a clue, but she does know that the person who requested for the merchant to take the necklace was also a part of Liberatio, the organization of evil spirit worshippers she told him about when they first met. Marnak finds it strange as it seems like Liberatio is having an internal conflict of sorts, if that is the case. But why? Pearly notes that it's not as bad as it seems, it's just a slight argument, not to be taken seriously. Marnak asks what caused this, but Pearly doesn't remember, even if she was told why. Marnak wonders if she is on any side at all, but she explains that she is neutral, and does things only when she's given money, or materials. Marnak asks why she would need materials, and Pearly notes that it's for her dolls, as she is a priestess that worships the great shaking string. Marnak thinks about it, and comes to the conclusion that the thing in front of him right now, and the thing that he met last time were both dolls. Pearly also remembers to tell him to watch out, as the guys that came with her were planning something, without her of course. Marnak sits in silence for a short while, and finally asks, Why is she being so nice to him? Pearly is pleasantly surprised that he actually asked her that, and notes that is an entirely different question from the ones he was asking. Marnak just looks at her, and then turns his back away, saying that he's not interested anymore. This makes her grovel on the ground, as she wanted him to ask, so he should. Didn't he want to find out? 
Marnak notes that she should just tell him what she wanted to ask of him now, while he is still here. But she refuses, saying that she will do that the next time they meet. Marnak smiles, and notes that if it's so, this will be goodbye, for now at least. He cuts off the head of the doll, and Pearly also wishes him farewell, while the head of the doll is flying around. Eventually, Marnak arrives at the camp, and just when he's about to get into his tent, Dakia stops him. He asks what she wants, as she should rest while she can, since they don't know when the evil spirit worshippers will attack again. Dakia says that she will, but she just wanted to ask him, where did he go, as she didn't see him return with the others. Marnak explains that he was chasing after the last carpal and felt the presence of an evil spirit worshipper while he was there, so he looked around for a while. Dakia is quite spooked by this and asks if he actually fought one, but Marnak denies it, as he didn't find anything of importance. That's when she suddenly starts cleaning his face with her handkerchief, which he immediately retreats from, as she will get it dirty if she does something like this. Dakia explains that she brought it for him anyways, so he should stop running away. She continues to clean his face, while Mother screams bloody murder at her, probably cursing her to the high heavens. When Dakia finishes, she hands him the handkerchief and wishes him a good night. After Marnak gets inside, tired from all of the action, Mother instantly transforms into her full form, with handkerchief in hand. She notes that she will also be washing his face, and Marnak tells her that she doesn't need to do that, but she insists, so Marnak lets her do it. The next day, while they are traveling, Marnak notices a strange rumble in the mountains, and thinks of Pearlie's words, that there might be an ambush soon. But that's when he recognizes what that sound is. But too late, as the avalanche has already started coming towards them. He warns everyone to remove everything from themselves and run while they can, but suddenly, Dakia gets in front of the avalanche. Marnak thinks that if he can stall the avalanche, just for a little while, most of the people will have time to get away. He looks at Dakia, and that's when he gets an idea. He explains to her that he needs her help, as the avalanche will be upon the merchants too soon, so at this rate, they will not be able to escape. If she helps, they can save all of the people. Dakia is surprised by his words, and he notes that she has to use her magic on the avalanche right now. Dakia is shocked that he actually suggested that, and says that even if she does that, it won't completely stop the avalanche, as she doesn't have that kind of magic. Marnak explains that she doesn't have to stop it in its entirety. They just need to stall it enough, so that everyone can get out of the way, so she should gather all of the mana that she can, and use it on the avalanche. Dakia notes that she won't be able to move while she's channeling the mana, and after she uses all of it, she will most certainly pass out. Marnak grabs her shoulder and swears on his name that he will protect her no matter what. This makes her blush a bit, and with newfound confidence, walks forwards, as to get prepared to summon all of her magic. She starts gathering all of the mana around, and after she is done, unleashes it in a beam, which goes straight in the middle of the avalanche and causes a large explosion. Dakia, however, doesn't stop and uses every shred of mana that is in her body. That's when it's revealed that Dakia is worth four fingers, something extremely valuable for Marnak. Eventually, her mana runs out, and Marnak immediately grabs her as she falls, noting that this is plenty already. After she is passed out, Marnak summons the giant beast and asks it to protect him and Dakia. It does so, and completely surrounds the both of them as the avalanche comes crashing down. Eventually, after everything settles, the beast digs out of the avalanche before it can harden, and Marnak follows it, with Dakia, who seems to be waking up right about now. With that, the beast removes a piece of rock that was hinged in its head, and leaves as to not be seen by anyone. Slowly but surely, Dakia wakes up, and asks Marnak if they really are alive. Marnak notes that they completely lost the people they were with, including their party. But yes, they are alive and kicking. He asks if she can move, but she says that it's not possible, probably due to the mana depletion she got. But he should know, at least, that she saw everything. Marnak's eyes widen, and Dakia explains that she saw him clearly summon a very large and quite freaky-looking giant. Marnak is now on full alert, and Mother even more so. Dakia continues, by saying that she knew he wasn't a worshipper of the Goddess of Preservation. Unlike him, the people who usually worship that goddess aren't as adept as him with the sword. 
and he is also much, much more powerful than they could ever wish for. Marnak tries to excuse this as him simply being more trained than others, but Dakia denies this and moves on to the next point. Secondly, he seems to be having a lot of conversation with the hand that he keeps with him at all times, no matter what. She is sure that he was being extremely discreet with it, but eventually someone would have noticed, and that someone was her. Marnak again tries to excuse this, by saying that is only a prayer that he does. Dakia notes that even if that is the case, she clearly saw him yelling for a mother, and that's when a large beast appeared out of a green portal. She tries to say that he is an evil spirit worshipper, but Marnak silences and warns her at the same time. Some people say that silence is like gold, so now she hasn't seen anything, not a thing, and since she is such a faithful person, she will keep her mouth shut, right? Dakia interrupts his yapping and explains that she doesn't care who he worships, not at all. He is a good person, and even if he is a tad too merciless most of the time, he is still a good friend. And part of the reason she accepted to do this was that he would actually listen to her if she was in this extremely vulnerable state. As he knows, she was born a mage, and thus, she received many resentful stares and hatred throughout her life. She can relate to his situation, even if just a little bit. So, even if he is someone who worships an evil god, she will be treating him like she always has, and will also keep the secret naturally. Mother listens to this without saying anything, but after a short while, she comes out, and starts pounding Dakia on the head, apparently out of sheer anger. Dakia is naturally shocked by this, and asks Marnak to do something about this raging child. He gently grabs Mother's hand, and tells her to calm down, as this woman is being genuine. He gets that she is worried about all of this, but he wants to try and trust her, like she trusted him all of this time. Additionally, since Dakia is a mage, she will make her swear to appease her worry. Mother accepts, but before leaving, she signals Dakia that she will be watching her very closely. Dakia asks Marnak what that means, and he tells her that she will be watching, it seems. With that done, he notes that now he has to make her swear an ancient tongue. Dakia accepts and starts doing it and is shortly done with the spell. Marnak tells her that now that she swore, he will answer any questions she has. Dakia asks why he isn't questioning her about what she swore, but Marnak explains that he understands ancient tongue so everything is fine. Dakia finds it quite impressive and seems to want to ask her first question. She wanted to ask him this question for a long time. What kind of women is he into? Mother immediately gets in front of them and Marnak notes that it's probably best to get moving, as they need to find their party. Dakia says that if he is going to look for the holy relic, she would like to help. Unfortunately, it seems that the evil spirit worshippers got to the merchant already and have the relic in hand, safe and sound. The woman who cast the avalanche notes that the priest she engulfed with Ing is probably dead or dying by now, so they should just return, as they got what they needed. That's when one of the notices something in the distance, the merchant, who is extremely angry that they attacked his merchant organization, but even more angry that they actually dared to touch his precious items. The ice woman immediately engulfs him in ice, but this doesn't stop him in the slightest, as his blue eyes glow even larger, and he breaks out of the ice while transforming his lower half into that of a horse. Androids are beings that have bodies entirely made out of metal, and they are well known for absolutely adoring minerals, and they can even replace body parts with them. Due to this, they are naturally covetous for any kind rare metals, and most of the mare merchants, solely so that they feed into this obsession. Shortly put, they are a species that, give enough time and money, will get stronger and stronger. Additionally, if the core is still kicking, they will not stop, no matter what. The merchant charges in, and starts shaping his hand into something else. The ice woman tries to block his way, but with his new lance arm, he easily breaks through, which shocks the ice woman quite a bit. One of the other evil spirit worshippers tells her to hold on, just a bit longer, as he almost got it. The woman screams at him, noting that he is completely out of his mind if he thinks that she can hold out for much longer, as this guy's entire body is made purely out of frost steel. The silent man looks at the merchant charging in once again, and slams the ground with one of his legs, which creates a black substance around the merchant that stops his movements. With this opportunity, the ice woman summons all of her magic, and engulfs his legs in in dark ice. He still manages to get out of it quite easily, but now it's too late, as the other evil spirit worshipper tells the ice woman, Kiruna, to get down, and summons a large worm, 
which spits acid on the merchant, which takes out an arm and hurts him all over. She urges him to call that beast to spit even more acid, but the guy explains that it's too cold for him right now, so he won't be coming back. He wants to say that they need to destroy his core, but that's when a large thud and scream catches their attention, as Marnak's giant beast is rushing in like it's in a sports competition. The Ice Woman tells the summoning guy, Lutham, to summon something again, but he explains that no matter what he summons, they won't be able to take care of that thing. With no other choice, she tells Pelham, the silent guy, to watch her back as she tries to block it with ice. This, however, doesn't do much, and Karuna demands that Pelham do his magic fast, as they will be dead if he doesn't. Out in the distance, Marnak, who is still carrying Dakia, hears all of this and asks her if she can move now. Dakia notes that she can try, and sure enough, she is able to stand on her feet once again. They watch as the beast fights, and she asks if he won't help, as she feels a bit bad for it. Marnak explains that he would like to, but since the merchant is also there, who is now in a truly manic state, everything will turn out fine. However, the situation is disadvantageous for him, as he is outnumbered quite a bit. That's when Marnak notices that the beast is throwing something their way, and when it lands, it's only a dead snowfield bat. Mother tells him to look inside, and Marnak does so, while Dakia watches in horror. Sure enough, something was inside. Something precious. The holy relic. The beast gives Marnak a thumbs up, and Marnak thinks that it's only natural that he return the favor. He asks Mother to reinforce a pre-existing authority, that one being the corruption giant. A blinding green glow envelops the giant fully, and soon afterwards, the bats each get slaughtered, one by one by one, as green beams come out of the corruption beast constantly. Marnak smiles with a depraved look, and the corruption beast seems to have evolved, now brandishing a set of armor. The beast of corruption starts to eagerly rip the beasts around it with ease, and the one who called them forth, Lutham, looks at all of this with a shocked yet defeated expression. Karuna tells Pelham to hurry up with his damn magic already, but before he can even attempt anything, he is crushed by a gigantic sword, something that sends Karuna over the edge of insanity, and she starts to run away as her fight or flight senses activates. That's when the merchant grabs her ankle tightly and notes that he will not let her go, no matter what. She demands that he let go, but he is relentless, with teary eyes. She demands that Lutham do something to help, but he is too focused on his own survival, as his eyes are filled with fear of the unknown and most importantly fear for his life. Before he can get too far, however, the gigantic sword strikes him, crushes his right arm and leg, and eventually, his entire being. Due to the merchant's condition, Karuna eventually gets free of his grasp, and her mind is set on only one thing, escaping. Now that the rest are dead, she has a chance to get the hell away from this place. Unfortunately for her, the corruption beast descends in front and instantly grabs her while she screams. She pleads to be let go, but her fate is already sealed as the beast is preparing to crash her into the ground with all of his might, which she notices but can't do anything about. The beast smashes her into the ground, creating a viscous paste where her body would be. Before deactivating, the merchant sees the beast in all of its armored glory and how his face is hidden by the headpiece. With that, his eyes dim and dim, until eventually the flicker that represented life is gone. With the new and improved beast of corruption, Marnak can use it to collect the divinity from the nearby bodies, which gives him a total of 6,300. They give each other a thumbs up, and Mother is surprised that the beast can now harvest in Marnak's stead, as she didn't know it would evolve to look like this in the first place. Marnak descends to her level, and notes that she has gotten more eloquent the more her seal is being lifted. Is she getting smarter, perhaps? This comment enrages Mother, and she asks if he thought that she was dumb up until this point. He says that it's not like that, as he reveres her and treasures her more than anything in this world. Dakia comes around and asks if she's not actually his hidden daughter, because he's very doting with her. This enrages Mother even more, and she starts flipping Dakia with both hands, a sign that she doesn't understand, because she grew in a sheltered environment. She also asks for a favor, to hug her, as she is very cute right now. Mother immediately gets close to Marnak, as she clearly doesn't want to do that. Marnak tells Dakia that this is enough, the next time she should try to get close to her with a snack in hand. Dakia agrees, and promises that one day, she will pinch her cheek. 
Marnak asks Mother if there are any new words that she can say, which makes Mother ponder for a while, before she finds out that she can. Marnak eagerly waits to see what she will say, and Mother confidently screams out one word. I. Inside of the Dragon Family Mansion, the member who is after Dakia slaps Hilden again, as he brought him the news about them being hit by an avalanche and then disappearing with it. Honestly, he is quite speechless at their extremely poor performance. Hilden thinks that he's talking just fine for someone who should be speechless, but anyway, what was he supposed to do? It's not like he summoned that avalanche himself. When he heard about it in the morning, he lost a bunch of hair because of how stressed he was. The Dragon family member notes that he heard Dakia was left the Eastern Branch region, and Dalton confirms it. She is now part of the main branch's jurisdiction. He thinks about it, and tells Hilton that the main branch always did a good job on everything, as they were also the first ones to capture Dakia in the first place. Hilden asks if he will be going to the capital, and the youngster says that he will, which brings a smile to Hilden's face. Finally, he is free from this lizard prince, and that princess he doesn't care for at all. He is free from them both, and can now go happily back to his family. The prince tells him to get up and get ready, as he will need a guide on the way, and he can't think of a better person for it, so he should get prepared as he will get the special treatment. He will be riding on his back though, so he should dress in something warm. Halden tries to tell him that he is the head of this eastern branch and can't leave his position like this, but the prince notes that, so far at least, his failures have not been reported to his higher ups. If he does tell them, however, what will happen to him, he wonders. Halden is now fearful as he didn't expect this guy to know all of this. He tells him to think of this as a paid vacation and get ready already. Halden's eyes fill with tears as he thinks of his family, but he will be back to them soon enough. The merchant caravan eventually arrives at the capital, while the merchant, who is now much smaller, tells Marnak about the knight in shining armor that valiantly saved him. Marnak tells him that he also said the same things yesterday about how magnificent he was. The merchant continues to talk his ear off about it, but Dakia approaches and whispers that, for a knight in shining armor, that beast looked rather scary, from her viewpoint at least. Marnak tells her that it probably didn't matter, as he was basically dying when he saw him. Someone comes from behind and tells the merchant that it's almost time for the interrogation. With that, he jumps into his arms from Marnak's shoulder and thanks him for helping them reach the capital. He will reward each of them quite well soon enough. They continue to walk and walk while the caravan slowly gets inside of the capital. And that's when Carmen tells his group about something important that he should have told them previously. Unfortunately, things might become a little crazy once they enter, and it's not a big deal, but they shouldn't be surprised by what's about to happen. Before Marnak can even ask what he means, a guard recognizes Carmen, and they all jump him shortly afterwards as he has to be arrested. They tie him up, and Carmen tells his group that he will take care of this problem on his own and will be back as soon as he can. The party just looks at him, because at this point, there is not much they, the can do. The prince eventually arrives somewhere near the capital and demands to be clothed at once after his de-transformation. Dalton instantly obliges, but he is quite happy as now, the headquarters people, that ignored lowly branches like his, will get a taste of this posh bastard too. The prince demands that he guide him to the capital, and Dalton says that he should hurry, as he will guide him through the quickest route accessible. The prince is rather annoyed by his haste, and notes that he has grown more confident. Back in the capital, the merchant explains that for Carmen, it's not rare to get arrested like this, as he is quite the troublemaker around these parts. Marnak asks what he's done this time, but merchant says that they should hear from him exactly what, as if they go right now to the guards, and say that they are here to visit him, they will let them in. Dakia suggests that they should go get some good food after visiting him, as she knows a few nice places around here. Marnak agrees that they should, and with the pleasantries out of the way, the merchant hands them the promised reward. Fifteen gold coins per person, amounting to sixty. Marnak opens the bag and is almost blinded by the glistening color of the coins. After coming to this world, this is the very first time he has seen so much coins at once. Dakia notices that he's acting like goblin around those coins and comes to the conclusion that this must be the first time he is seeing so many gold coins. Really. He truly has a cute side to him. The room falls silent as they all stare at her in embarrassment, and to break this atmosphere, Marnak notes that he is always cute. 
Dakia thinks that he must be joking around, and Marnak tells the merchant that there should also be some other reward for retrieving the item he had. The merchant explains that he will get that to him by tomorrow, as there is a difficult process he needs to go through beforehand. Afterwards, they go to visit Carmen, but Sajida parts with them halfway through, as he has somewhere to be. Marnak is shown around the capital by Dakia, and they seem to be having fun. Eventually, they arrive at the building where the guards are stationed, and Marnak says that it has simple but hostile look to it. Dakia notes that it's true, that building is not cute, like he is. Marnak tells her that she doesn't seem to be letting things go easily, and she asks if he's mad about her teasing him. Marnak notes that there is nothing to be mad about, as he is as she says, but they should go and see Carmen, before the food they got for him gets cold. Inside of his cell, Carmen is being fed by a woman, who seems to endear him in some way. That's when he spots Dakia and Marnak, who says that he looks like he's at home in this place. Carmen smiles, and says that it's because he comes here often enough. The woman that fed him notes that he comes here too often, and presents herself as Aerith Grata. Marnak also introduces himself, and explains that he has heard quite a lot from Carmen about her. Dakia asks what he did to get in jail this time, and that's when someone from behind them responds. He is here because he has stolen from Sir Enthus Valtus's private storage. It was also that same man who put him on the wanted list. So what did he intend to do with the key that he stole? Carmen calls him his brother, and Marnak starts to analyze the stranger. If he is truly Carmen's brother, he is the son of the Black Wolf, and the Vice Captain of the Queen's Royal Guards, the fabled Frost Knights. The White Wolf himself, Setian Valtus. He asks once again, why he stole the key, and what he did with it. Carmen notes that he has already used it. It's gone. Setian is surprised by this, but instead of being mad, he seems worried for his brother, and asks if he is hurt anywhere. Carmen confirms that he is not, and Setian ponders what to do for a moment. As he know all too well by now, their father hates thieves, but not only did he steal something from his personal storage, he can't even return it, since he has used it already. He must remember what their father used to say all the time, that accomplishments that are made through unfair actions are as worth as the trash people throw away. No matter what his justification is, stealing cannot be considered justifiable. Carmen explains that their father used to always say something else. Rules have to stand upright no matter what, for everything else to also stand as upright as them. Naturally, he agrees with that saying. But if this is the case, why did this rule neglect his mother? As soon as he was born, why, just why did his mother have to leave the family without saying a word? With tears in his eyes, Carmen says that even a drunkard from the alleyways would take responsibility for his own woman. Is their father's honor really not on par with the common drunkard? No matter how many times he begged, no matter how many times he asked to know about his mother, he always kept his silence and avoided the topic. Like the coward he is, that is precisely why he stole the key, to find his dearest mother with his own two hands. Setian asks if he really stole the key for this purpose, and Carmen swears it on his name. Setian relents to this, and notes that he will talk with their father for him, something which seems to move Carmen quite a bit. Marnak notices that they are pretty close, but when Setian looks into their direction, he and Dakia immediately look away. Setian apologizes for letting them see this during their first meeting, and he's sure that his younger brother was quite a handful. That's when he recognizes Dakia, and asks why is she here, and not in Beatus. Dakia says that she is just traveling the world for a bit, which he doesn't agree with, as the smiling young master is sure to be worried about her. Dakia explains that her father would never be worried about her, so he shouldn't worry. Grata asks how long Carmen will be staying in this cell for, and Setian explains that, according to their father's orders, he will be in here at least a month, but he will be talking with him about it today. Dakia wonders what to do with so much time, and Marnak notes that they must go back as soon as possible, right? Dakia tells him to think it over, as she has never rushed them into anything. Setian notices that she called him Marnak, and he asks if he is the Marnak, the one known as the Arch Nemesis of the Evil Spirits. Marnak confirms that he is, and so, Setian asks if Carmen was also a part of Eradico's saviors. Marnak confirms that indeed he was, which reassures Setian, as with this, it might be easier to convince their father. He apologizes for the late introduction, and shakes hands with him. If he ever has the chance during his stay in this city, he should visit the Valtus residence with Carmen, 
as they will welcome him warmly. With that, he excuses himself and leaves. Marnak says that he is quite different from him, and Carmen explains that he is truly a great person and his role model, not like him. Dakia says that he just got pretty mad at his dear role model, but Carmen excuses this as having to get things off of his chest, that's all. He also asks if that bag is for him, and Marnak explains that they brought it because they thought he would be starving, but it seems that their worries were unfounded. They leave them to their reunion, as Dakia knows of a pretty good spot to eat. Marnak accepts this proposition, as it's best to let these two lovebirds be. While in the inn, Marnak thinks that, according to the Trumpeter of Death, there should be a holy relic around here. However, he can't know for sure, and there really isn't a good place around here to get some information. Maybe now is the time to use the thing that Trayden gave him a long time ago. Dakia suddenly knocks on his door, and Mother immediately tells her to leave, which Marnak thinks is a bit harsh. She comes in and notes that today she won't be rejected, as she has brought snacks from the most popular bakery. These are breads filled with delicious cream, and instead of words, she would like a hug. Mother slaps the pastries away and says one word. I. Dakia asks what she means by that, and Marnak translates, She cannot be tempted so easily. That is what she said. The next day, at Ile's main base in the capital, the priestess gives one of the workers there a drawing of Marnak. Believe that he really does look like this. Due to how crude the drawing is, the employee asks if this person really is human. The priestess says that he is human, but he should have been able to tell just by looking, right? He also asks if she knows she is willing to pay for the request fees, but the priestess tells him not to worry, as she captured some criminals on her way here, so she has money. The employee thinks that if this is the case, she might be giving more than the minimum amount requested which is good for him. She hands him a pouch with 12 gold coins and 33 silver coins, which seems to not be enough, as the man's face drops. She asks what's wrong. Was she perhaps too giving? The prince and Halton walk with a certain person, and the prince asks how much further they are from the destination, as it seems they are just going in circles at this point. The man tells him to relax, as they will arrive soon. Halton thinks that if things continue like this, the prince will get mad soon, and it's pretty obvious who he will take his anger on. The prince notices his cowering, and asks why he has that ugly mug, which makes Halton apologize instantly, as he didn't mean to disturb him. The escort smiles mockingly at this, which makes Halton angry, as they are basically in the same position. Suddenly, the priestess walks past them, and Halton is a little bewitched by her beauty. He asks the prince if he saw that beautiful lady walk by, but he doesn't really care, as there are plenty of pretty girls, practically begging him to like them, so there isn't a need for another as they can be annoying sometimes. Halton wonders why he is so obsessed with the princess then, which makes him mad, but he will get mad if he asks more questions, so he will have to shut up. Eventually they arrive, and the escort welcomes the prince to Ela, while also telling Halton that he must return. He thinks that this is disrespectful, as he knows full well his branch is inferior, but he is only an employee, and he is ordering a branch leader around like this. The prince announces that he is coming with him no matter what, which makes the escort sigh, as even if someone of his status requests it, they cannot have members from the branch here. Suddenly, the prince slaps him behind his back and asks if he just dared to sigh in his face. While the escort is getting the beating of his life, Halton smiles, as he is glad that someone else is receiving punishment, and not him. All the resentment that he had for this guy is now gone. What a joyous day. The prince tells him to move his ass and Halton immediately does so, as this is also a chance for him to see the idiots from the headquarters get beaten to a pulp by the prince. Back at the inn the party is staying at. Mother keeps rejecting Dakia's treats, and this time it was quite harsh, as she said that she is a being that cannot be fooled with temptation. With that, Dakia leaves with a sad expression, and Marnak says that this time, she was a bit too harsh. There are countless ways to reject someone, and most are not as harsh. Dakia had no other intention, and she just wanted her to have these, just because she wanted to. He knows better than anyone else around that the mother he respects is someone who can acknowledge her mistakes and is also the noblest of beings. Mother starts to feel bad about her actions, and Marnak tells her to apologize next time she sees her. She should also eat some of the bread Dakia bought, as he's sure it tastes wonderful, especially since it was a gift. 
He hands her one, and when she bites into it, she is captivated by the taste. So like a cat, she takes all of it and eats it in bed. Marnak warns her to not eat super fast, as she will have stomach problems if she does. Suddenly, Dakia comes back and asks if she may have a piece of the bread too, as she didn't try it yet. But that's when she notices that Mother is indulging herself, and they both stare at each other. Dakia smiles, however, and asks if she's enjoying it. Ten minutes later, Dakia is sitting on the bed while holding Mother, who is still enjoying her bread, although angrily. Even later, Marnak goes shopping, and Dakia accompanies him, as she promised to not tell anyone about his secret. Swore, in fact. So meeting the friend of the demon he's friends with shouldn't be a problem, but he is really living in this place? Marnak says that this is the marked location on the map, so it must be so. They go to the person standing in front of the house, and the man asks what brings them to his humble abode. Marnak shows him an insignia of sorts, which is in the form of a shield, and the man welcomes them inside. When they do so, Dakia asks what he showed him, and Marnak explains that he got it from the demon he met a while ago, as he told him to use it to visit his friend. Dakia didn't expect demons to be detailed, and she also didn't expect for them to forget things, as they are beings of higher intelligence. Anyway, what surprised her the most about this, is this place, as she didn't even know something like this was in the capital. Marnak says that he has never been to the capital up until now, which makes Dakia give him the title of Country Bumpkin. She also asks how he's not more surprised about these buildings, as they are quite amazing. Marnak thinks that he has seen even grander and prettier buildings in his past life, so something like this is not that impressive. A mysterious man suddenly approaches them, and Dakia asks if she should attack him with magic if he starts doing something weird. Marnak doesn't want to die crushed under a building, so he tells her to relax, which makes her even madder. Marnak asks the man if he's their guide, and he only nods, and so they start following him. Eventually, they make their way to a door, and when they open it, they spot a woman, who is sitting in a bed, and asks what they want from her. Marnak notes that he wanted her to help them with something, and she asks for their names. Marnak introduces the both of them, and when she hears his name, the demon grabs his clothes tightly, and asks if he's really the infamous demon slayer of Guiz. Is he truly that Marnak? While she holds him like this, Dakia clenches her teeth, and tells her to let go of him right this second, otherwise she will blow this whole damn place to pieces. Marnak is more scared than the demon, and tells her to relax, as they will all die if she does that. The demon asks who that is, and Marnak introduces her once again. The demon smiles and apologizes, as this was just a harmless prank, nothing to be so fired up about. She sits down and notes that she indeed crossed the line. She introduces herself as writhing curiosity, and the common people may call her a demon, among other things. She also asks Marnak what kind of priest is, as he is clearly not a priest of preservation. He tells her that he is a worshipper of the Mother of Corruption, which makes Curiosity gasp, as she didn't expect to meet the Son of Corruption like this. She asks him to come a little closer, as she wants to read his mind. Marnak asks if that really is a necessary step, and Curiosity tells him it isn't, but he shouldn't worry, as he can't read much while in this body, so she will just find out how he's still fine, even after all this time. Marnak wonders what she's talking about, but just when it seems like the mood is relaxed, Curiosity jumps at him, as he is much different than the other sons of corruption, but Mother comes to the rescue, as she slaps his hand away. Curiosity is quite surprised by this, and asks what this little thing is. Marnak notes that he already introduced himself, which makes her say that this is going to be really bad. He asks why that is, and she notes that he must be after his mother's holy relics, right? How many has he gotten up until now? Four, maybe five? Marnak wonders how she knows so well, and also asks her to explain in greater detail. Curiosity says that she can't. He should rather ask mother that. She looks at Marnak, and shrugs, as she doesn't know a thing about this. Curiosity is even more surprised, and asks if he really just talked with a god so casually. Are there no consequences for this? Marnak explains that normally, he talks with mother on a daily basis, as communication is the key to upkeep their relationship. Curiosity sighs, as it seems that the son of corruption hasn't gone insane, just yet. He also is talking to her without any payment, and she doesn't know a thing about what she's talking about. She also asks, since when he could talk with her so casually, ever since his body was improved, perhaps? 
Marnak explains that he was able to do this from the beginning. Curiosity is even more curious now, but warns him that putting all of his eggs in one crumbling basket is not really a good thing. Well, seeing his current situation, he probably didn't have any other choice. But she warns him now that he will have to work extremely hard in order to pay back everything he has received. Marnak attempts to ask her what she means, but she only says that the situation he is in right now is like walking on a tightrope. If she says any more than this, the guys upstairs will notice. Marnak knows that she's talking about the heavens, but will the gods of that place really realize? Curiosity licks her lips and says that he must already know. If he wants something from a demon, he must give something in return. Marnak expected this, so he asks what she wants, and she instantly asks him to sleep with her, which makes him frown. Marnak asks her to repeat herself, as he probably just didn't hear her correctly. But she confirms that she requested to lay with him, as she has never been with a son of corruption before, since they were all a bunch of psychos. Dakia denies this instantly, which makes Curiosity ask why not. Dakia becomes embarrassed and just tells her no, that's the final answer. Mother also jumps on her and starts pummeling her, but due to her tiny body, Curiosity doesn't feel a thing, so she just stops. Marnak looks away as he knows that Curiosity is right. She asks them to calm down, as this was just a harmless joke. She just wants the badge that he used to get inside of this place. Did he perhaps not get that information when he first got it? Marnak angrily pulls it out and says that he unfortunately hasn't. Curiosity tells him that it's fine. Small pranks like these add a little fun to life, as that's the meaning of life, right? Marnak agrees, and Curiosity lets Mother go, while also noting that if he's looking for the holy relics, he's going to ask her to find one. Isn't that right? Marnak says that she's correct, and Curiosity explains that the relic he wants is in her possession. Both Dakia and Marnak are glad to hear this, and Curiosity shows her underground arena that they need to participate in order to get the relic. She does have the relic, but unfortunately, she put it as a reward for winning the underground fights. The crowd cheers as the gladiators fight, and Curiosity sits down, as she holds up her side of the bargain so she wishes them good luck in the coming fights. Back in the arena, everyone cheers for a fighter named Bigfoot, a brutish man who is extremely large. The announcer tells everyone that his opponent is a rookie, who makes his entrance with wonderful jumps, which the crowd likes, as they have never seen anyone move like this before. A hooded figure comes to the betting table and puts it all on the rookie. This hooded figure was Dakia, and the rookie was Marnak. A few days ago, Marnak asked Curiosity if he couldn't just take the divinity from the relic and give it to her once they are done. Curiosity didn't agree to this, as the other evil spirit worshippers will catch on to this instantly. What he needs to do is join the arena, as this is something connected to him and his dearest mother. She also asked if he knows about Liberatio, which he confirms. Curiosity said that he will definitely run into more of them while searching for the holy relics, so he should reduce their numbers beforehand. Additionally, he is now in the kingdom's capital. If he didn't realize, so does he understand what that entails? Marnak says that they will not be able to use their authorities as easily, since the resident priests spread around here will notice. And as for him, he might lose, depending on a couple things. But he will not die from an attack that has no divinity in it. He tells her that even with this, he doesn't plan on killing them so recklessly, simply because they are evil spirit worshippers. Curiosity heard otherwise, as he must have taken out quite a few of them by now, but Marnak explains that he had a reason. Curiosity saw how fussy he is, and gave him a reason to, as she showed him what the evil spirit worshippers did. She showed him the countless lives they have taken, the endless suffering that they have gathered. All they did was kill and slaughter. Marnak asked what that was, and Curiosity explained that they were all memories of the evil spirit worshippers. Is this reason enough to kill them? Marnak asked if this is really the truth, and Curiosity confirmed that, sadly, it is. Back to the present, everyone cheers for Bigfoot, as they probably have no faith in Marnak. He thinks that this was a great chance to wear a mask, specifically this mask, that can change at will. He got it from the merchant a while earlier. Bigfoot tells him to get ready with his armor and weapons, but Marnak just flips him, which causes Bigfoot to rage as he has never been disrespected by an opponent like this before. He attempts to unleash a mighty attack on Marnak, and when the attack hits something, 
It creates a shockwave that can be seen from the spectator seats. Marnak dodges his attack, however, and he mocks Bigfoot with a hand sign. This makes him even angrier, and so he tries to hit him with all of his might, but Marnak dodges it with great ease. He does this until he finds the opportunity to slap the snot out of him. The most disrespectful attack. This causes Bigfoot to unleash an even mightier attack that envelops the whole arena. Marnak has simply dodged, and the announcer says that in all their fights, they have never seen anyone so light-footed. It seems that this rookie came without armor for a purpose. The public tells Bigfoot to hit him already, which causes him to charge in once again, as he knows he cannot disappoint the crowd any longer. Marnak sits motionless while Bigfoot tries to wail on him, but in the second that he strikes, he grabs his head and jumps high into the air. Everyone including the announcer is shocked by this, and Bigfoot begs for help, as he knows that he is going to be in a world of pain because of this. Marnak puts him in a wrestling position and lands down with great force, something which makes everyone cheer as they see Marnak stand victorious. Everyone thinks that it's over, but that's when Marnak starts climbing the nearby wall with his bare hands and jumps from it, directly on Bigfoot. He lands directly on his chest and finishes the fight, for real. This time, the announcer tells everyone that the rookie is the winner and puts the megaphone to his mouth, as they want to hear a few words from the winner. Marnak picks it up and announces to everyone that he will kill them all. This makes the crowd explode with cheer, and Dakia, who is with Mother, cheers also. After the match, Dakia drags Marnak around the city as she wants to eat a limited time bread, which is apparently the fluffiest in the whole city. She warns him to hurry, as it's made from a limited amount. There's already a few people buying it. Suddenly, Marnak notices someone similar, but before he can look further, Dakia grabs his hand and drags him away, leaving him to think if it was really that person or just someone who looks similar. When they get back to the tavern they are staying at, Mother climbs on the bed separators and imitates Marnak and how he dealt with Bigfoot. She even imitates the movements he did afterwards, with Marnak being quite embarrassed about it, but Dakia finds it amazing. Curiosity arrives in their room and notes that even here, they are practicing techniques. Marnak apologizes if it bothers her, but she claims that it doesn't. It makes the atmosphere around pretty good. Additionally, if she were to repeat herself, the last match went pretty nicely, and was quite memorable for those watching. For a priest, he sure went ham on Bigfoot. Marnak says that it's not like it seems, but Curiosity notes that she meant what she said about it being memorable, and she also heard from Bigfoot that he started rigging the fight in the middle of it, right? He told him that if he does not want to die, he should act like he's in pain, no matter how hard he hits. Marnak explains that it wasn't rigging, but rather, they were both like-minded individuals, and came to an agreement. They put on a pretty good act that was performed quite well. Curiosity doesn't care what it was, as long as it performed well. However, due to this, she's thinking of adding more matches that have acted in them when the opportunity comes. However, they need a new actor, as Bigfoot up and left, because he wanted to become an actor, or something like that. So she will extend him a hand and invite him to work for her, as she is sure he will become the star of the arena in no time. Marnak thanks her for the generous offer, but he will have to refuse, as he has one duty, to release the seal that has been placed on Mother. Curiosity just stares at them and notes that it's disappointing to hear, but there is nothing that can be done if that is what he wants. However, this act that he performed will allow her to use it whenever she wishes. Marnak allows her to, as he was just mimicking something that he was watching in the past anyways. Curiosity says that it doesn't feel fair to use it for free, so she will reward him when the time comes, which Marnak accepts. Curiosity then asks if there's anything she can help regarding the next match, but Marnak says no, as his next opponent is an evil spirit worshipper anyway. The crowd cheers as the announcer tells everyone about the fight. This will be the headbreaker versus the new rising star the newbie, who made everyone scream in delight, the human slaughterer. Everyone calls out his name, but some also notice that he now has a Bigfoot weapon. Did he perhaps kill Bigfoot and steal his weapon? That is what everyone chooses to believe, and when Marnak gets on the arena, he tells the headbreaker that his real name must be Getum, right? He asks how he found out, but Marnak doesn't answer, as he is glad that he just confirmed it. The announcer prepares everyone for a great fight and tells them to start. But in the second it starts, Marnak rips his head out of his neck. Everyone is left awestruck, including Dakia, who knew that it was going to be like this. 
Marnak simply leaves, as he enjoys putting up an act. But when it comes to these scum, he cannot hold himself. Somewhere else, the prince is mad that Kantar, the Ilay headquarters higher up, said that kidnapping Dakia again will not be possible. There are three reasons. Firstly, Dakia came here under a pseudonym, and they were able to kidnap her secretly. But she came to visit the capital officially this time, so it will be hard to even get close to her. Secondly, this time, she has companions around her that are not easy to deal with at all. The bastard son of Enthus Valtus, a member of the Red Bear Mercenary Corps, and most importantly, the evil slaughterer, Marnak. The prince sees this as a good thing, as if they just show the priest and mercenary some cash, they will just leave, and then it will be easy to capture her. Kantar notes that the priest is unbribable, as he is well known to have killed many evil individuals or things, and it will be hard to think that he would betray his companion like that. It is also rumored that he and Dakia are in a secret relationship. The prince slams his fist on the table, and Kantar explains that, according to their informer at least, Dakia visits Marnak's room in the dead of the night, every night, for a while. However, only their organization knows about this, so it's fine. The prince orders him to not let the information leak no matter what, which Kantar agrees with. Finally, they get to the final reason, the White Wolf and the bastard son's brother, Setian Valtus. They received info about his meeting with the princess, so if she disappears, he will surely make a move. And who knows? His father might get involved too. While the prince laments everything, Kantar laughs, as he's glad this bastard is getting humbled. Halton suddenly begins laughing, which Kantar doesn't know why, but he soon finds out, as the prince slams his head on the table and tells him to listen. He can tell the queen all of the dirty deeds they have done, and he will be safe, as his father is the only Dragon King magician in the world, so he will just have to lay low. He orders him to bring Dakia to the Dragon Kingdom without harming her, no matter the cost or way. At a Liberato meeting, one of them notes that this newbie, the human slaughterer, is definitely after them. Since it has come to this, they will not die with no purpose, and instead steal the holy relic from the Arena Godmother. They are all allowed to use their authority, but they will have to move quickly, before the priest and queen's knights make any moves. At the same time, somewhere else entirely. A man explains the operation to a few other men, who are all masked, and are ready to capture their target, no matter what, they must not fail. When the next fight is ready, everyone is ecstatic to see who will win. But just when they are about to start, a sudden explosion occurs, and the kidnappers swiftly go on the move. The evil spirit worshippers see this, and they also get on the move, before things become too messy to deal with. The man Marnak was supposed to fight has no clue about anything that's going on, but suddenly, the Queen's Knights lead by Carmen announces that this is a crackdown on illegal fighting. The Knights move in and apprehend anyone involved, but that's when Carmen notices the kidnappers and tells them to drop their weapons and kneel. They also chase the evil spirit worshippers. Carmen issues order after order, saying that some should follow him and some should stay at the door, but Marnak tells him to not do that, as he should focus on those guys. They are after Princess Dakia. The spectators also confirm this, as they have heard them say it, which makes the kidnappers disperse, but not before Carmen tells everyone to chase after them, and calls in Sajida, who immediately strikes one of them. Without much choice, the kidnappers withdraw, as the knights give chase. Marnak barges into Dakia's room, and explains that the evil spirit worshippers are going to curiosity, while her kidnappers are clashing with the royal army. While he changes, he also notes that they must leave now and hands her his mask, to make it harder for them to recognize her. With that, they get out of the room to leave, but that's when a few kidnappers appear, who kill one of the personnel. Marnak tells Dokia that they will attack from now on, as getting surrounded will not help their situation at all. He charges in with great speeds and strikes one of the kidnappers, which allows the other one to charge Dakia, but she's a mage, so she just burns his eye, and kills him. Marnak congratulates her on a job well done and they both go to the emergency exit, while Dakia asks if Curiosity will be fine. Marnak confirms that she will, as a demon like her, who has stood in the same body for a long time, is very hard to kill. Sure enough, the evil spirit worshippers are having trouble with her, but they don't give up, as some want to go to the relic and steal it. Since it's a demon, it must pay a price for this power. 
Curiosity tells them to not be happy just yet, and shows them a pile of bodies, the ones she can use as payment for her powers. With that, she summons her true power, and the evil spirit worshippers will be in a world of hurt soon enough. While Carmen deals with the kidnapper who attacked him, he laments coming here like this, as he wanted to get more experience. But since his soldiers are less experienced, they are losing. Bad. However, Marnak and Dakia are probably out by now, so what he needs to do is protect the soldiers, as he is their commander. He tells the soldiers he just saved to gather their wits and join their brothers in battle. Then, he announces that they will give up on defeating the enemy, and that from now on, they will focus on defending. He tells one of the soldiers that he will be the commander from now, and he should prioritize their lives. He asks Sajida if he can still fight, who confirms that he can. Now, their mission is set, to kill those bastards. Marnak and Dakia are unfortunately spotted, and they are now on the run. But one of the men gets in front of them and demands that they stop. Naturally, that doesn't work, as Marnak tears him up and grabs his dagger. Some more kidnappers come from the left, so Marnak uses the dagger to break the blade of one and tells Dakia to charge in. She does just that and kills one of them, which allows the other to attack her. Again, she is a mage, so she just blows him up, like any good mage would do. Marnak takes care of the rest, and fortunately, these seem to be the last ones, at least for now. Dakia hands his mask back to him, as it's quite hard to fight with it on her face. Marnak takes it back, and Mother warns them that more are coming, and sure enough, their moment of peace is broken, as more men come from all directions. Dakia asks what they should do, and Marnak tells her to destroy the ceiling, as he will protect her. She does just that, which allows them both to run away. After a short while, however, they are stopped once again by the kidnappers, who warn Marnak to leave, as they have no quarrel with him, and they will actually pay him more than she paid. Marnak notes that Dakia promised her weight in gold, so can they offer more? The kidnapper notes that they naturally can, their client will give double. Marnak is impressed by their volition, however they cannot give him gold that smells as nice as this one does. Dakia blushes heavily, and the kidnapper thinks that he's joking, but he is cornered. Can he really win against so many people? Marnak explains that a cat does not care if there are more than ten rats, so why should he? The kidnapper is extremely angry and tells the others to jump in. They do just that, but Marnak pulls out his chainsword and meows. Thus begins his slaughter, and he doesn't stop until every single kidnapper is dead, except one, their commander. Marnak just smiles in his face and cuts his neck. Curiosity also deals with the evil spirit worshippers, as only one remains. He asks how long she was alive for, and she says that she was alive before the first son of corruption was even made. Now it's his turn to answer. He is a priest of the Mending Needle, right? The inside of his head is in tatters. It must be his work. With her power, she demands he answer, but instead of that, the priest just summons his god. She also notes that from some digging, she found out why they were getting the relics. They planned to descend a part of God on Earth and break the balance that has been maintained for so long. Mending Needle arrives in her room and tells her to shut it, as she is nothing but a lowly demon. Thank you for watching. See you next time.